I hope so. I, uh, now I can hear myself uh, much louder. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today at the final event of the Exhaustion Project. Uh, we're not going to leave you exhausted, um, although we do have quite um, a packed program. The Exhaustion Project, we're going to hear a lot more about it, um, but it's a project that started back in 2019 and basically has looked at the intersection of climate and health, um, also looked at heat and air pollution and how these two exacerbate health, uh, damaging health effects, notably um, uh, on heart and lungs. Uh, one of the other things it's done is looked at the vulnerabilities of different groups. It's modeled scenarios and basically looked at, um, yeah, at the intersection of these, um, these different research areas. This is, as I said, the final event. So the idea is to talk you through some of the results from the project, uh, but also to get your feedback on some of the recommendations that emanate from the project. So it's been a research project. The idea is ultimately for the, the findings to feed into the policymaking process. And you'll notice we've set up several points uh, in the morning where you have an opportunity to ask questions and also to feedback directly uh, as we showcase the recommendations um, that have come out of the, out of the research. There will be a final report, um, and that too will incorporate today's feedback. That's the, that's the plan. My name is Sonia van Rensen. I'm an energy, climate and environment journalist here in Brussels. I've been here since 2006, so I've seen my fair share of EU policy packages. Um, I've been editor-in-chief of a website called Energy Monitor the last three years, which is dedicated to the, the global energy transition. And uh, I like to go out and moderate when I have the opportunity. It always feels like a treat to get away from my desk and actually meet people and make sure that I talk to people who are doing the things that I'm supposed to be writing about, commissioning and advising some of the, the younger reporters on. So it's a very opportune time for this conference. Uh, we have a number of policy developments that are directly linked. Um, We've got, we'll hear from Francois in a moment, but we have uh, trilogues about to start on a revision of the ambient air quality directive. On the climate policy side, uh, things are in full swing for preparation of, uh, of COP28. Uh, and finally, the WHO Europe is updating its recommendations for heat health action plans. So these are all processes that we would hope the results of the exhaustion project uh, will feed into. Today's a hybrid event, so that means uh, there's actually a lot more of you than might seem the case. Uh, I think there's around 200 people watching this uh, online, so a welcome to those of you who are joining us from afar as well. All the speakers are physically present, uh, except for one, someone from the WHO, Maria, who will be joining us uh, remotely uh, a little further down the line. Those of you joining us online, you can send in questions via the, the chat function on the YouTube channel. And we've got Miriam at the back, who's going to feed back some of your, your comments and questions from there um, into the discussions. Those of you here will take some physical questions as and when time allows. And we've got a microphone. Uh, so when you, when you get the floor, just briefly introduce yourself. And if you could stand up when you ask your question, that'll make sure that people online can, can also see you properly. Um, as I said, there'll be opportunities for feedback. We'll use Mentimeter, which is basically like Slido to do that, but you don't need to worry about that yet. We'll give you the code and so on and instructions on how to use it as and when the, the moment arrives. Um, with that, I think uh, my general bit is over, and I want to hand over, first of all, to Kristen uh, Aunan, Research Director at the Cicero Center for International Climate Research, and the person who has led the exhaustion project to give you a bit of a flavor or a reminder of what it was all about. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, I'll be very brief now. I will present a bit more detail after uh, in a while. Uh, but uh, first of all, as a coordinator of exhaustion, I want to wish you all very welcome to this uh, policy conference, which is arranged by exhaustion. And as you said, uh, Sonia, it started in 2019. It's a research and innovation action. Uh, funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 program. And the consortium consists of 15 partners in 11 different uh, countries all across Europe. And uh, we are a group of uh, climate and air pollution modelers, epidemiologists slash biostatisticians, practi practitioners in cardiology, public health experts, ge geographers and economists, both within micro and macro economy, and a large group of co communication experts. 
And on behalf of the consortium, I will first start to extend our thanks to the Commission and the hardworking apparatus in Brussels and beyond, which enables research projects such as ours to take place. The background, the starting point for our project is that extreme heat and, um, has been identified as a key climate change risk in Europe, in the near and the long term. At the same time, we know that air pollution is currently the largest environmental risk factor for human health at the continent. Heat stress and air pollution increases mortality and morbidity for many health outcomes, but particularly for cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. Uh, the full name of exhaustion, which is actually an abbreviation and which actually explains what we do, is exposure to heat and air pollution in Europe, cardiopulmonary impacts and benefits of mitigation and adaptation. Uh, the ultimate goal of exhaustion is to contribute to evidence-based policymaking by equipping target stakeholders and users with actionable knowledge that can help limit health damage from climate change. As part of this effort, we therefore arranged this policy conference and we will present major scientific results from the project and discuss policy implications of our findings. So, uh, thanks to everyone who is attending uh, in the room and online. We are very happy to have representatives from the European Commission, DG Climate Action and DG Environment, and a speaker from WHO. Uh, European Parliament members, as well as NGOs and other stakeholders. So we look forward to getting your feedback on our findings and recommendations and discuss how our research can contribute to policy processes in Europe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kristen. So we'll move straight on to our first keynote. We've got two keynote speakers from the European Commission to kick us off this morning. And first up, I'd like to welcome uh, Elena Bardram, Director for Adaptation and Resilience, Communication and Civil Society Relations at DG Klima at the European Commission. And someone who's been involved in the EU climate policy scene for a very long time. <laughs> Too long, in fact. <laughs> My mic is also on, I hope. Yeah, very good. Okay, thanks very much, and Kristen, uh, congratulations to you and all the staff working on the exhaustion project. I, I think it's something that is very pertinent today, and every day when we get more evidence about what's going on, it uh, proves its, its uh, kind of importance in the intersection of science and policymaking. For us as policymakers, it's, it's really vital to get that type of information in order to inform our attempts and, and efforts to develop policies that respond to the uh, evolving challenges. There's no need to say how, how important kind of the, the climate conditions and, and the nexus between climate and health has become recently. What we've seen with the recent forest fires, what we've seen with the heat waves and the immediate impact this has had on people's health in terms of uh, heat exhaustion of workers, but also in terms of air pollution that comes from these forest fires is, is very, very significant. Just this uh, September, more than 2,000 health journals have called for governments to take emergency action to tackle catastrophic harm climate is causing health. So, so this is uh, something that is, is really a, an emergency call and the policymakers need to respond accordingly. Uh, in 2022, Nature uh, publication has estimated that more than 60,000 people lost their lives in Europe because of uh, heat and climate-related consequences. So the numbers are, are becoming uh, so tangible and so high that they are simply too big to ignore. Heat and air pollution are killers. And we need to also accept that uh, the productivity loss and the other economic damages that it causes have significant impacts on GDP and uh, the competitiveness of our industries as well. Um, it's been estimated by ENBEL, the sister project to this very project, that uh, these losses could be up to 800 billion. And, and that, too, is something that corresponds to a multitude of the EU's annual budget. 
What we also know that the European Environment Agency, in their latest air quality report, found that 97% of EU's urban population is exposed to clearly unhealthy levels of fine particles. This is something that uh, can no longer be ignored. Airborne allergens and pollen that are linked to the heating environment also cause further damages and further risk to human health. So as policymakers, what are we doing? What have we been doing thus far? Of course, the EU's uh, 2050 package and our long-term climate law setting a very firm goal for climate uh, neutrality, net zero emissions by 2050, work very directly in terms of reducing emissions. They also reduce uh, air pollution. Also, the fact that our mitigation efforts can help us avoid even increasing heat levels, avoid further climate change, is something that makes a contribution, although it may not be so immediately visible in our everyday lives. Mitigation remains central as an EU policy priority, and the recently finished Fit for 55 package anchors that in the direction of travel that the European project will take in the years to come. In addition to mitigation efforts, we have the adaptation strategy from 2021, which uh, launched the EU Health Observatory, which has already been taken very much into the level of implementation, really multidisciplinary, reaching out to several different health communities, practitioners, and allowing them to access information that makes them more agile and ready for the changed climatic conditions. It's about anticipation, availing information, but also better preparedness. In the context of the adaptation strategy, we also have the mission adaptation, which is an innovative Horizon, uh, 20, uh, Horizon EU project that reaches out to the local and regional communities, availing them with the best state-of-the-art practices that they can then make use of, including in the health sector. What we focus on is replicability and scalability, because it is often the local and regional level that has the best understanding of the challenges. And also the health and air pollution-related challenges are very much localized and they need to be contextualized in order to tackle them best. We recently had, July this year, a Budapest declaration, ministerial declaration, uh, that issued uh, the invitation to do national health adaptation plans, and that's something that's being pursued. At the COP28, in a couple of year, uh, weeks' time, we will have the first ever health ministerial in the context of a COP that will also issue a specific declaration charting the way forward for the international community. The EU supports the contents of that declaration, and, and we will be uh, working with WHO and other partners to see how we can take that into action as well. Uh, using resources of the LIFE program, we already provide financial support to WHO, helping them update their guidance on heat health. But uh, surely what's being done so far cannot be enough, and this is why in the context of our preparations for the next commission. Uh, the EU team in DG Klima has been working uh, together with the European Environment Agency to produce the first ever European climate risk assessment, which looks at the exposure of key policy sectors to the consequences of climate change. Health is among the central priority areas of focus. And we will be coming forward with uh, an assessment of our own policy readiness, but also the readiness at the uh, member state level to deal with the already changed circumstances. In September, global temperatures were measured to be 1.75 degrees above the pre-industrialized levels. So we're not talking about the future action. We're really talking about the action that needs to start taking place today. The risk assessment will be ready during the first quarter of 2024. And we have confirmed now in the Commission work program that the Commission will come forward with a political communication that will be our response, our recommendations as to how we can make our policies better fit for the 
realities of today, and prepare for the realities of, of a possible overshoot scenario, which may not be too far away, taken into account the more recent data. What's really important to note that we're not looking to spread this desperation or, or say that oh, this has all become too big for us, but we want to focus on solutions. And by doing that, we want to tell the European public and our constituencies that the institutions are not only aware of what's happening, but they're also prepared and willing to take action and to do that across different policy sectors. This, in our turn, will be an ability and an opportunity for us to beat what concerns me a lot, which is this climate defeatism. People somehow feel that it's all too big for us to deal with. And it's also an opportunity for the EU as policymakers to get ahead of the impact. So, we will continue to pursue ambitious mitigation policies, but what you will see in the spring is a serious effort to step up our action on the area of preparedness and readiness to climate change. And why is the window of next spring very important? There will be parliament elections, and there will also be the, the definition of the priorities for the next Commission's mandate. So, with our communication, with the risk assessment, we hope to steer those discussions to the direction that allows us to be well prepared for a, a changed climate, but also the challenges related to health and climate and air quality. Thanks, I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. <clears throat> it sounds like there are lots uh, of initiatives coming up precisely at the, yeah, the junction of, uh, of climate and health policy. Uh, notably, as you said, a uh, first European climate risk assessment and health being one of the, the main areas where you do um, in, in the focus of that and where you expect recommendations on uh, feeding back on how to, how to better take account of the climate impacts on, on health. I wonder too, I guess that remains to be seen, but you mentioned the political landscape uh, towards the end, whether, um, whether health is indeed an area and connecting health and air pollution more to climate policy is something that um, I guess can yeah, counteract defeatism, but also reinvigorate and reinterest people who are perhaps more skeptical and worried about the socioeconomic costs of climate policy uh, and give them a reason to, to support it, I guess, uh, remains to be seen going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we move then to our second keynote speaker, uh, Francois Wackenhut, uh, Head of Unit for Clean Air and Urban Policy at DG Environment. Um, and, well, about to embark on very exciting trilogues. <laughs> Indeed. Um, good morning, and it's a pleasure to be with you um, this morning. I actually didn't know until recently that I would be able to be with you, because as Sonia mentioned, uh, we are really at the stage where the negotiations are intensifying towards their finalization on the revision of the ambient air quality directives. So we're not always um, the masters of the agenda at this stage. So I'm very pleased to be able uh, to be with you today. And um, I would like to start by, of course, commending uh, Cicero, Exhaustion. This is work that is tremendously impactful. This is work that will have a bearing on our work in the Commission. You heard from Elena that holds fully for DG Environment and for all the work that we're carrying out in the field of air quality. So uh, this is EU money put to very good use, and uh, I would like to congratulate you for the achievements that you've made through the project. Now, turning to the air quality setting, um, what um, I would like to, to emphasize is that, well, I'm speaking to uh, a set of colleagues, experts, researchers, who've contributed to the advancement of knowledge on air quality and air pollution, uh, but it's always good to start the discussion on air quality by stating that, unfortunately, one of the hindrances that we sometimes face is that, unlike heat waves that are very visible, air pollution is not always visible. And it doesn't mean that it's not harmful, because it's actually extremely harmful, as you all know. I always use this image of uh, the hair, um, and one can fit about 7 PM10 particles in one, about 28 uh, 
when it comes to PM2.5, and of course, many, many, many more when it comes to ultrafine particles. This has led many um, in the field to refer to the invisible killer that we're trying to address here. And what I would like to uh, convey is that there is a lot that has been ongoing at the level of the Commission, but also, of course, at the level of all the institutions that have supported our work and all the stakeholders that have been contributing to the extremely um, comprehensive consultations that we carried out before we put our proposals on the table. But there's, there's been momentum on the revision of the ambient air quality directives. That started, it's a, it's a journey that started in 2017 when we reviewed the legislation. It carried out until 2019 when we published the evaluation itself. Then the Green Deal came, and the Green Deal, in addition to setting uh, the ambitious targets that Alina alluded to when it comes to climate change on the climate neutrality front, there was also a very strong commitment to a zero pollution ambition, as part of which a commitment was made to uh, revise the ambient air quality legislation, which we had last revised in 2008. And why was it decided that we needed to revise the legislation? Well, because the evaluation that we had carried out showed that we had been successful in many ways, which is very positive, but that the science had evolved tremendously also over the period, and that a number of improvements could still be made in order for us to be even more decisive in the uh, effectiveness of the action that we uh, need to undertake at EU level. So this is what we did between 2019 and 2022. Almost a year ago, well, a little bit more than a year ago, on the 26th of October last year, we put forward a revised proposal to the European Parliament and to the Council of Ministers. This has been the subject of intense discussions since, and uh, we've now reached the point where both institutions, um, both co-legislators, are ready to initiate the trilogue discussions, which in our jargon in Brussels means the finalization of the co-decision process towards legislation entering into force. So this has been a long journey, but the journey is not over. However, the clock is ticking. And for the Commission, it's ticking from two perspectives. It's ticking from a very practical viewpoint, which is that, as Elina has also mentioned, we're reaching the end of the mandate. And as we're reaching the end of the mandate, we need to complete this work in a way that will ensure that the new legislation will indeed enter into force in due course. And so we do, and we're pleased to see that this is also the direction that is being taken by the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers, we need to complete this work. And that means we need to have an agreement by early spring. And so this is an extremely intense process. But the clock is ticking also from the health viewpoint because the emergency that air pollution is requires that we act determinedly now. In the latest uh, data that we've published in cooperation with the EEA, well, actually, that the EEA has published and that we've um, supported and um, uh, worked closely with, we're unfortunately still in a situation where over 230,000 premature deaths in the EU are generated by uh, air pollution. This is not acceptable. This is a reality that is far better than it was five, ten years ago, but nevertheless, it remains unacceptable. And the premature death level is only one measure of the challenge, one of the instances where we need to, I think, through you and through all the communities that can help us advance also the understanding of the issues. One aspect that we need to emphasize is, of course, the impact on the daily life of all the populations that are first and foremost impacted by air pollution. Vulnerable populations are the most affected. The EA actually, back in 2019, already published a very, um, important, uh, very important report called Unequal Exposures and Equal Impact that already back then established a very interesting link between the impact of heat waves on health and the impact of air pollution and noise, actually, which is also something that we're working on actively, but on which we're not revising legislation at this point. Um, and this is a social imperative as much as it is a health imperative. And that can never be emphasized enough. It is the most vulnerable among our populations that suffer the most 
from air pollution, and clearly your research has demonstrated that if we look in combination at uh, heat impacts and the impacts of high air pollution levels, and certainly higher than we would like to achieve in the EU, those impacts are even greater and more uh, negatively adverse. So this is something that we need to also tackle in our own uh, next steps. I will not go into speculation about the direction of travel that um, will be chosen by the co-legislator. All I will say is that um, the, the Parliament, um, which published its position um, in, in September, um, is asking for action that would go beyond the level, in some instances, of what the Commission is foreseeing. Uh, what we've put on the table is solidly underpinned by an impact assessment that, of course, has been accessible and uh, has been the subject of, uh, of, um, of intense discussions before it was, uh, it was published. But in that regard, I would like to underline that I think it sets the discussion in the right motion in the sense that the health imperative has also been at the core of the discussions that have taken place so far, which should be the um, orientation. The Council of Ministers decided on its position more recently, and this is a, uh, a position that will now be the subject of discussions as um, of um, the um, end of this week. We will start the, the conversations. And uh, as I said, this is something on which we will need to continue to get momentum from the communities that inform the debate, that provide the evidence base that is so precious to the science policy interface that Alina also mentioned uh, in her intervention. And you can count on the Commission to continue to link up the air and climate agendas. This is precisely the essence of what we've done in the Green Deal. This is something which no doubt will be reinforced and that will be many, uh, in many ways thanks to the work that you've put on the table. And I very much look forward to the outcomes of your discussions today as uh, further um, enriching our own conversations across institutions on what we need to achieve to deliver for our citizens the air quality they uh, deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much also for giving us a, a bit of a history of how we've ended up yeah, at the start of Trilogues. We will have the, the rapporteur, so the MEP who's in charge uh, of the, uh, the Parliament's um, role in those Trilogues with us later today for a panel discussion. So that will be an opportunity to ask him, I guess, where, uh, well, he's not going to speculate either, but the, the main sticking points and I guess what, what plans he has or how he intends to defend the Parliament's ambitious position in, in this case. I'm going to hand back briefly to, to Kristen to give us a bit more of an idea of what we uh, want from you, uh, from all of us today. Thanks a lot. So I will, um, if the slides can be put up on the screen. Yeah. So as a... Uh, Elina already noted very clearly, uh, there have been alarming reports on unprecedented heat uh, lately. Um, I'm sure many of you live in regions where you have experienced uh, strong heat waves. Actually, the last 20 years, there have been very many strong heat waves in Europe. And uh, these are just two uh, quotes that I think are important. Uh, Samantha Burgess, the Deputy Director of EU's Copernicus Climate Ch Change Service, she says that we can say with near certainty that 2023 will be the warmest year on record. And it's currently 1.43 degrees above the pre-industrial average. And the World Meteorological Organization also recently came out with a report where they say that for the first time it's more likely than not that global surface temperature will exceed pre-industrial levels by 1.5 degrees in at least one of the next five years. So the figures show, I will not go into details, but it really shows that something, something is happening now and it's, uh, the warming is going more and more rapid. And uh, what about Europe? Europe seems to be uh, a heatwave hotspot. Uh, warming in Europe is um, 
is going more rapidly than in other parts, uh, some other parts of the world. And there have been, we don't know exactly why, but there have been different uh, suggestions. This is just some example, uh, stating that Europe is a heat wave hotspot, uh, having upward trends that are three to four times faster compared to the rest of the northern mid-latitudes over the past 42 years, just an example. Some, uh, some ideas or uh, uh, ideas about how, why that is happening. Uh, attribution is another important topic when it comes to heat waves and global warming. So we can say that, oh, there have always been heat waves, but it's becoming more and more clear that uh, we can attribute the recent heat waves, the really strong ones, to, uh, to anthropogenic emissions. So there's kind of no doubt about that. Uh, Europe is a hotspot for heat, but it's also a hotspot because of our uh, population. We are an aging population, and, uh, and uh, as I say, exhaustion addresses cardiopulmonary diseases, and actually cardiovascular diseases causes 60% of deaths in Eastern Europe, 52% in Central Europe, and more than a third in West Europe. So this means that we have a large pool of susceptible individuals when it comes to impacts of climate change and uh, air pollution. Uh, as we, uh, we come back to, um, increasing heat also increases the risk of wildfires, which comes with air pollution. Uh, cities is also a hotspot. I mean, cities get even hotter than the average landscape around. So that's also a question. Uh, the, I will not go into details, but the point here is just to show that uh, at, at three degree European warming, which is maybe what we are heading towards, cities in Southern Europe and Eastern Europe will be even hotter, up to five degrees hotter, so uh, at the three degree warming. So cities is a hot spot for heat. It's also a place where uh, policies uh, to reduce or to abate and to, um, to adapt, uh, to implement adaptation policies, is it's an important uh, um, actor. Uh, as we have mentioned already, and the novelty of the exhaustion project is that we try to look at extreme heat and increasing temperatures and pollution uh, in context together. Uh, so um, we look at the, the, the physical science and basically we can say that we have identified what we can call a double climate penalty. So global warming in itself can worsen air quality through several mechanisms. Chemical physical processes in the atmosphere, increased emissions including from wildfires, etc. And it will make it diff more di difficult to reach air quality targets. And with, as we will hear later today also, concurrent exposure to heat and air pollution amplifies the health risks, especially for heart and lung disease. So there is a double cl climate pen penalty, but that of course also means that we are, if we are able to abate and reduce emissions, we will have a double dividend. Uh, briefly about the objectives of exhaustion. So uh, we ask, uh, what do the trends in heat and air pollution mean for the health of the Europeans? So we look into the exposure response relationships. What is the relationship between temperatures and uh, cardiovascular and respiratory death and disease in Europe? So we have different data sets that you will hear more about later, identifying those uh, relationships. And we look at uh, how air pollution might modify the relationship. So there, are there some synergistic amplifying impacts there when you're exposed to both heat and air pollution? And then, <clears throat> important question, can we identify contextual and individual vulnerability factors and use these findings to project the future health burden and design climate policies? This has been an important part of the exhaustion project. It's difficult, we need data, but we are starting on that uh, process. Uh, we ask, uh, what will ambient temperatures and air pollution concentration, how will they develop in Europe given different emission scenarios? So we had different futures, we try to use data and models to say something about how will it look in, into the future scenarios. And finally, what is the current and future health burden from heat stress and air pollution? Number of premature deaths. And what is the socioeconomic costs and consequences of the health burden across the continent? So topics today, we will go through uh, what, uh, what do we in, uh, exhaustion say about projected warming and air pollution developments in Europe? Health effects of interaction between uh, heat and air pollution. How far have we come? How do have we understand this uh, interaction? Current and projected temperature-related health burden in Europe. Different scenarios, different health burden. 
socioeconomic costs of climate change and benefits of climate action. So, um, uh, the importance for us is to discuss with you the relevance of findings for EU policy making, both related to mitigation and adaptation. And uh, we are very happy if we can get some input. Uh, we are now fine tuning our final recommendations, so we invite all of you to contribute to that discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kristen. So we move on now to um, the first, I would say, chunky session in the program, uh, where we're going to kick off with three presentations uh, of results uh, from the project. After that, we're going to get a bit of commentary uh, on those results. Um, and then we're going to, to have an opportunity for you to, to feed back in writing as well and have an opportunity for some, some Q&A. But first, as I said, three times, uh, three presentations. Speakers, please stay within your 10 minutes um, to make sure we get through you all. First up, I'd like to welcome uh, Alexandra Schneider, uh, who has a degree in meteorology, a master's in public health, uh, and a PhD in human biology. She's headed up her own research group, Environmental Risks, at the Institute of Epidemiology at Helmholtz Munich uh, for over 10 years now. She's also deputy director there and is a frequent visitor at the US Environmental Protection Agency. Um, over to you. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, I need my slides, please. <laughs> okay. So if you look at the number of deaths and look at to which risk factors they can attribute it to, you can easily see that air pollution and non-optimal temperatures range among the top 10. This makes clear that the environment is a major factor determining our health and our quality of life. And we already identified several factors with beneficial or adverse effects on health, but what's still missing is a comprehensive assessment um, as these factors do not affect humans isolated, but jointly. And this becomes more important because um, in Europe, um, more and more people live in urban environments, and then on top of all these environmental factors in the urban um, city, uh, in the urban areas, um, we will have climate change on top. Um, so far, um, unfortunately, health effects of environmental factors and especially of heat have been looked at very isolated. But as you can see from the slide, um, there's a, a joint um, effect on health. So there's an interplay of environmental factors, which is very complex. They um, interact with each other and also with individual factors. <coughs> Therefore, the idea of exhaustion was actually to look at the interaction of heat and air pollution. And we came up with a metaphor of we breathe climate change. <clears throat> and um, because air temperature and air pollution will affect us um, jointly and nobody can escape, of course, every public health action has a very high potential for beneficial effects and prevention. <clears throat> the idea of exhaustion was to uh, structure it in three different levels. So we looked at the health effects of the interplay of air pollution and air temperature in the cities. Um, then in the next step, we covered whole countries and looked at very small areas like municipalities. And then the third level was more on the individual basis where we took advantage of existing cohorts in Europe. Um, these are the results for the pure temperature effects, and you see the usual U-shaped uh, exposure response functions, where we see a very steep increase with heat um, causing a, a very um, a rise in um, mortality. And if we look at the different, um, different mortalities, you can see the blue line um, that, especially for respiratory mortality, we see a very steep increase. If we now look further on days with low, medium, or high air pollution, we can easily see that um, on days with high air pollution at the same time as heat, we have a much stronger heat effect. 
So we can say, for example, here for, shown for heart disease, air pollution worsens heat effects on mortality. And this is even more true if we look at lung function or lung diseases. Um, so air pollution and heat jointly also um, make the effects of heat worse on, um, on um, respiratory mortality. Um, we can see this also confirmed then in our small area approach where we looked at uh, five different countries and looked in these municipalities. So you also see here in red the days with high air pollution um, compared to blue and black where we have medium and low air pollution and you on average see an increase um, of the heat effect with more and more air pollution. We also saw that um, other factors influenced our heat effect. So it was also very important to look at population density, um, then at, uh, at the degree of urbanization in the small areas, then the coverage with green space, and again, the level of um, fine particulate matter. So these also came into the game when looking at the heat effects. Um, our results were also confirmed at the cohort level. It was not as strong as at the city level and the small area level, but also here we on average saw an increase of the heat effects with more air pollution on the same day. <clears throat> so I conclude. Um, that um, atmospheric environmental exposures, of course, do not affect humans in isolation, but they are instead exposed to a mix of environmental factors. And so as in exhaustion, a comprehensive view on these multi-exposures is essential. Um, then as a next point, um, as we saw that air pollution worsens the effect of heat on health, it's very important to um, think about the alignment of new air pollution limit values with the latest WHO air quality guidelines, because that would lead to an improvement in health and prevention, of course, from the air pollution perspective. But then also this helps significantly in mitigating and adapting to climate change. And as a last point, um, I would suggest that integrated environmental, climate and health policies have synergistic effects um, on health and can generate co-benefits. And so it's very important to think about policies in a very broad way and not to focus on just one of them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we continue in this section, indeed, looking at the intersection of um, air pollution and uh, climate change. Uh, we're going to look now at a series of emission scenarios uh, with Ulas Im, a senior scientist and researcher at Aarhus University in Denmark, where he's worked on atmospheric modeling of particles and gases for over 15 years. Um, so his area of expertise is, is looking at the interaction of particles and climate and ultimately also the impacts that has on health. Over to you. So thank you for the introduction. I hope you can hear me. Yep. Uh, so I will today talk about uh, our uh, air pollution and uh, climate projections in the exhaustion project and how uh, heat waves or droughts and also air pollution will evolve in the European future under different emission scenarios. So we already heard plenty of times today that air pollution is the invisible killer and it's the most Im important environmental challenge associated with high mortality over Europe. But we also heard a lot that heat waves and extreme te temperatures also directly impact um, mortality, but also morbidity in Europe, but also elsewhere. So reducing air pollution uh, helps uh, mitigating climate, but also uh, improving the health. Uh, and it, it, it reduces the rate of uh, increases in mortality and will substantially impact society uh, through improved uh, quality of life and saving uh, healthcare costs. 
So one of the motivation why we are looking in the future is that we already know uh, that climate change leads to increased intensity uh, in the duration of magnitude of heat waves. And in the exhaustion project, we did run global and regional uh, climate models to look at how this will happen in the different uh, scenarios, uh, from very really ambitious emission reductions up to uh, worst case scenarios where we just continue as we do today. And, and, and the, the, the point is that in all the future scenarios, we can see that the, both the duration and the magnitude of heat waves will increase almost ex exclusively everywhere in Europe. Uh, but the degree of uh, change is uh, much more uh, uh, in, the, in the southern Europe. So southern Europe is much more vulnerable compared to the other parts of Europe not, uh, in, in, uh, to, to extreme heat and cli climate change. But another uh, reason why we're interested is, as we have already heard today, that these heat waves and droughts are expected to lead to increases in uh, uh, wildland fires, which is, as itself, is a source of air pollution and it's a, a toxic one. And in the exhaustion project, our, our colleagues at the Finnish Meteorological Institute build up a predictive model that can predict in the future how air pollution can uh, how, uh, how wildland fire emissions uh, can change uh, under different climate scenarios. Uh, and I'm showing just one uh, results here, but the overall point is that uh, in all different ecosystems that can be burned with wildland fires, we see an increase over Europe. Uh, the increase is much more uh, accelerated in the second half of the century, but also we see an increase in the, in the first half of the century, uh, which has, uh, of course, implications uh, in uh, large air pollution episodes down, down with of this uh, uh, fire areas. So uh, in the exhaustion project, we did set up a multimodal ensemble of uh, regional uh, air pollution models and see how different emission scenarios uh, will change uh, wildland fires and then uh, anthropogenic emissions over Europe and how the uh, resulting air pollution levels, especially fine particulate matter and ozone, will look like in, in the future. And we use uh, three different scenarios for the period of 2015 to 2050. Uh, taking uh, emissions uh, and climate uh, scenarios from the coupled model comparison project, which fits into the IPCC assessment reports. So as you can see in the lo lower graph that we have different uh, projections uh, of, in this case, uh, CO2, but that follows also the air, other air pollutions, where we have different levels of mitigation and adaptation, um, and we'll see over this domain how these will affect. So uh, jumping into the results, when we do run all these uh, different models and look at how uh, ozone and uh, fine particle metal will change over the uh, European uh, domain, uh, we can see that uh, uh, for, for ozone, for example, on the left-hand side, that when we really mitigate high, which is the red and the green lines here, that uh, the ozone concentrations, uh, surface ozone concentrations decrease over Europe. When we do just as we do now and continue, which is the blue, uh, then we see a slight increase, but there's a lot of year-to-year -year variability. But ozone levels continues to be a threat. Uh, for the fine particular matter, which is the uh, right-hand side, we, we can see that um, uh, fine particular surface concentrations, they decrease in all emission scenarios across Europe. Uh, from 11 or 10 percent up to uh, 35, 40 percent, depending on the emission scenario. So the more we mitigate the emissions, of course, the higher reductions. I also highlighted with the uh, dashed black lines the, the new WHO guidelines. Uh, uh, and uh, this picture might though look very optimistic, but we should also take into account that the, the model has biases in certain cases up to 30 percent. So if we also assume that these biases hold in the future, so we actually also push the green line uh, uh, ab above the threshold. So it, the message is that we really have to follow the very ambition emission scenarios, which is very key to reduce air pollution, but also climate change in the short term. So another way to look at these different plots is that especially where the changes are happening, uh, ozone on the uh, top panel and then uh, PM2.5 particulate matter on the a lower panel, and uh, overall, again, the same message, the more we mitigate, the, the more reductions or changes we can see, but the changes are mainly concentrated over uh, Central Europe, where we have the main pollution hotspots already today, like the Benelux region, the Povela region. Uh, so here we see the largest increases, but we also see increases overall uh, over, over Europe. So it's really important that we, we mitigate uh, 
this uh, air pollutants regionally and globally since this is a transboundary phenomenon. Uh, we also developed an exhaustion and statistical downscaling tool. So until now, I've shown you results over a uh, kilometer scale, which was around 20 to 30 kilometers, depending on model to model. So we uh, built a statistical downscaling uh, tool, uh, which can further uh, downscale these projections up to one kilometer. So we can really go to city scale. Uh, here I give an example uh, for, for the Brussels, uh, just to show that the, the model is doing uh, in, the, in the first uh, uh, left panel that the, the model is doing quite good in terms of predicting the observed uh, maximum temperatures. And then when we look at in the middle panel uh, how these changes translate in the different projections, here I, I show results from the most ambitious scenarios, SP126. We can still see that there are increases all over uh, Brussels, but depending on uh, the areas. Uh, we have la larger or smaller increases. And this really says that the, uh, for this scale, the land use and the urban planning strategies are very really important and key to mitigate and adapt impacts. So my key messages are that heat wave duration and intensity are expected to increase, uh, which will lead to elevated air pollution. And uh, the increasing temperatures uh, we see are in all cities across Europe. Uh, but there are certain cases why the heat island effect depends on the local conditions and how the urban planning is uh, going. So over Europe, the surface concentrations are overall projected to decrease. Uh, but uh, we should note that we really need ambition emission scenarios uh, to go really below the WHO recommendations on a regional level, but more importantly on a city level. And we, we, we also uh, say that the mantle model ensembles are key to provide more reliable results uh, compared to single model uh, realizations. So my key recommendations are that regulation of health and climate-related air pollutants following the most ambitious socioeconomic emission pathways is, is a must, and it should happen now if we want to really go below the WHO recommendations. And urban and land use planning should be taken into account for heat adaptation and action plans on a city level. Uh, to combat the effects of climate, uh, climate change. And we also need observation uh, networks with focus on health-relevant air pollutions that they should be extended in order to provide a data-driven evaluation of these mitigation adaptation strategies, but also evaluate our tools that can project into the future. And with that, I would like to stop and thank you for your attention. Hey, thank you very much. So ambitious um, em climate emission reductions can deliver uh, very substantial benefits for, for health by reducing air pollutants at the surface level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we come then to our, our final presenter in this first series, uh, Surangzu Chowdhury, a senior researcher at Cicero, also an atmospheric scientist, looking again at air pollution, heat stress and human health. Uh, and modeling using chemistry climate models and satellite retrievals to look also particularly at the impact of wildfires. Yeah, so uh, I move on. So, yeah, so we all know that climate change affects air pollution. That has been the central uh, part of the discussion until now. And, uh, you know, the main effect of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how climate change affects air pollution is through meteorological factors, through modifying meteorological factors. And the main effect of meteorological factors is on natural emissions and wildland fires. So on this uh, right-hand side, uh, what you see is before and after a major wildfire event in Berkeley. So you see the blue sky is up top, and then you see what, what you see is orange sky. And that's because of these tiny bits of particles which are released into the air. They're really, really small, and they you know, reflect black, back the uh, blue light and let the orange and the red light to pass. And so you, you see these uh, orange skies when you have uh, very bad episodes of uh, wildfires. And we all know that wildfires make scurbit a result in a range of health issues, including respiratory and cardiovascular endpoints. And uh, there have been few studies in the recent past which says that emissions from wildfires can be more toxic compared to other sources. 
Well, so the objective of this part of the work is to quantify the contribution of forest fires on long-term air pollution exposure and chronic impacts on uh, human health for the present and the future scenarios. Uh, so I'll be very brief. So we used uh, the fire emissions that were developed by the FMI group. Uh, so that has the capability to produce fire emissions beyond the satellite era. And uh, all anthropogenic emissions were obtained from the SEDS uh, emission inventory, and these were fed into a climate model, a, a chemical transport model, and the resulting outputs at uh, two cross two degree resolution globally and at 20 kilometer over Europe were used for health impact assessment. Well, so what we see here, I'll first explain this figure on the right. So we have uh, the blue lines, which are PM 2.5 exposure, which are population weighted, and the red lines, which are contribution from the fires. So what we see in general is that uh, the, the PM 2.5 exposure has been decreasing by over 50% uh, over Europe. So the solid bold lines are uh, for uh, our population weighted over Europe, and uh, the dashed lines are for Eastern Europe, the dotted lines are for Central Europe, and the thin solid lines are for Western Europe. So you see that in all these regions, PM 2.5 exposure has been decreasing over the last 30 years, from 1990 until 2019. However, if you look closely that the red lines, they are increasing over this time period. And that means that the forest fires are increasing. And this has been counteracting the positive impact that we are having on air quality to multiple air quality di directives that we have had in Europe. So translating this into excess deaths, we see that uh, excess deaths from PM 2.5 exposure decreased from 600,000 over Europe in 1990 to, uh, to, to around 300,000 in uh, 2019. That's a 50% reduction. However, the forest fires, the impact of forest fires on excess deaths have been increasing in the same time period. And uh, what you see on the right are the fire mortality rates. So we see that uh, you know these are excess deaths from forest fires for 1,000 deaths from uh, ambient PM 2.5, and they have increased in all the countries of Europe. On the right-hand side, uh, on, on, on the, on the, yeah, so, yeah, on the y-axis, you have all the countries of Europe, and the blue dots are for 1990, and the brown dots are for 2019. So you see that there has been an increase in fire mortality rates in all the countries of Europe. Now, uh, there have been a few studies in the recent past. We say uh, that forest fire emissions can be more toxic as compared to other sources. So we did a sensitivity study. And uh, by assuming forest fires to be twice, which are, uh, which are orange bars, uh, five times, which are red bars, and 10 times, which are brown bars, we see that uh, you know, uh, by, by assuming forest fire emissions to be more than 10 times uh, more toxic as compared to other sources, 13% of total PM 2.5 related excess deaths in 2019 over Europe may be attributed to forest fires. And even more, you know, 25% of these total, total excess deaths in Eastern Europe may be attributed to forest fires in 2019. And uh, as, as you saw in the previous presentation, that we expect PM 2.5 exposure to decrease over Europe under the most optimistic scenarios. And what I show here are uh, uh, the projections of excess deaths from PM 2.5 exposure and forest fires. So we see that PM 2.5 uh, related excess deaths are expected to decrease over Europe uh, under the combination of SSP RCP scenarios. And uh, however, the excess deaths from forest fires are projected to increase by more than six times uh, at the end of the century as compared to 2014. And uh, these are for Western Europe and Central Europe. Uh, the dotted lines are for forest fires, and you see that they increase significantly uh, over time until the end of the century under even the most optimistic scenario, which are the blue lines, um, SSP 126. 
And now uh, the spatial representation for the uh, percentage contribution of forest fires to excess deaths in the future. Uh, so on the left hand side, we have the uh, figure for 2010 to 14, which is uh, the present. And on, on the right hand side, we have the combination of scenarios, SSP 126, 245 and 370 for the end of the century. So you see that at the end of the century, uh, forest fires are expected to become a significant source in the Scandinavian countries uh, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, so I don't have a pointer, but you can see here that it's, it's, it's a significant source in the Scandinavian countries by contributing more than 20% of excess states. So the conclusions, uh, forest fires are increasingly becoming an important source of PM2.5 related excess states in Europe, counteracting the improvements in air quality. And if these emissions are more toxic as compared to other sources, they may result in about 13% of excess deaths uh, from air pollution in Europe. And it is expected to result in at least six times more uh, deaths in Europe compared to the present day at the end of the century. A couple of recommendations. Uh, uh, what I say is that even in the most optimistic uh, scenario, it is anticipated that contribution from forest fires to ambient air pollution will increase in the future and make it difficult to meet the air quality guidelines. And consequently, robust adaptation measures, continued effective forest management, and preparedness are essential to address respiratory health. Uh, what resonated with us is something that we had really good intuition, that it's really respiratory patients that are in the center of the both impacts of air pollution and climate change and health. Uh, results by Alexandra to show that it's really respiratory disease mortality that is the steepest curves both for heat effects and air pollution effects and the interaction really resonate for us and, and stress the importance of our work that's uh, for, for lung health, for respiratory patients, that I immediate actions on, on both agendas are really, really important and, and that's something that we, we work on. Uh, we have been both active in uh, advocating for strict air quality directive revisions now. We have published a statement on air pollution uh, calling for uh, full um, uh, implementation of WHO recommendations, listening to science and urgency of this matter also is really important to us. Uh, as, as we discuss now certain delays in, in, uh, ahead of trilogue, we want to stress that patients are paying the price in number of deaths, in number of symptoms and things that we don't, we don't even count in these projects, and the delays are not acceptable. Um, we are also working to bring air pollution and climate change together. Uh, clearly, these are not separate issues, and this project really brings beautiful data to show that um, in addition to all our very good evidence on how much uh, increasing heat will cost uh, respiratory health uh, uh, and air pollution. We see that two joined together add even more evidence why we need to mitigate both climate change and, and clean up air pollution immediately. So uh, I thank to yeah the, the project for delivering these important results. Timing is really crucial now in trilogue to bring additional evidence to uh, uh, enormous evidence we already have. Um, so I, I hope that that will resonate here in Brussels and bring it also forwards to COP28 that we're also going to, to speak also for mitigation of climate change yeah. impacts yeah. for respiratory health. And, and do you see uh, a, the way the research brings together these formerly disparate topics, climate, air pollution, health, do you see those coming together in the world of policymaking as well as in the research? Uh, definitely. I, I think uh, we have expressed, we both made a climate change statement just recently published in both climate change air pollution mm -hmm. statement. We point out that uh, there are co-benefits reducing air pollution for climate change mitigation. Climate change mitigation brings immediate benefits via uh, air pollution reduction on health. I, I, I think policymakers are listening. We heard that this morning. Mm. Uh, yeah, you were encouraged by what you heard. But we, we were missing such clear results as, as these. So, so yeah. uh, now we have them. Mm -hmm. Annette, how about you? Yeah, so um, I would like to congratulate the researchers because I think indeed when this started, there was a lot of evidence of, uh, on air pollution, both on respiratory as well as heart disease, but heat was really something which kind of was only associated with circulation. And um, now you have produced the data that it's actually both. And I think that very well fits into the systemic um, approaches, and you have provided European-wide data that this is not something which is happening in a decade or that we, even though we are now seeing the changes due to climate change, that the health impacts are coming in the next decade. You actually showed that there have been 
in the previous decade and that they are there and that they're everywhere. And I think this is really important. Um, also, uh, in addition to showing the interaction and the potential for adaptation and mitigation to climate change, as well as the air quality directive, I think a, a very important aspect is in addition that we will see temperatures to rise and weather, weather extremes being more frequent, even though, even if we do really drastic uh, political measures and really push the transformation of our society and our industries forward. There we won't see um, the benefits. What was nicely shown in the projections is that actually we will see uh, the benefits with respect to air pollution. And I think this is really crucial to tell to policymakers. And this is an argument I'm trying to make uh, uh, politicians and other, lobby, other stakeholders listen to in Germany that we need the ambitious air quality guidelines in order to show the successes. Because with respect to weather and weather extremes, we won't see successes over for the next decade. But we are able to show successes with air quality, and we will be able to argue that this is a double win for health. Do you, because we mitigate the air pollution impact, the side and killer, and we reduce the health impacts of heat. And I think the exhaustion project is kind of the, in a way, the victim of their own successes, because when we heard the um, representative of the commission speak, your results were already uptaken. So I think this is a super success, and you should say this so clearly, that this is not only what you publish now, but what is actually like common sense already now. And my final statement would be regarding to the Expanse project, where we will take up these results. It's very encouraging because we have now also modeled uh, Europe-wide air pollution and weather indicators to look at um, individual cohorts more deeply, to link in um, molecular um, indicators. Um, and so we are, we are working more towards the biomedical meaning uh, and extending your results. What I find important when we move forward in looking in more detail on the mechanisms is that we, yes, we have vulnerable populations and it's always important to remind everybody on that. But also these effects, both air pollution and heat, are working on everybody. And I think this is really important. The benefit, of course, you see it most, most clearly in the vulnerable, and you need to identify them well to support them with public health measures. But everybody will really um, uh, benefit. And also, if I'm healthy today, in three decades, I may, may be a vulnerable person. So I think we should also take into account more the life course um, perspective. And again, Expands will try to contribute to this aspect as well. OK, thank you. So the, to make more of the fact communicate that um, whilst the greatest benefits may accrue to the most vulnerable, there are benefits here for, for everyone, which I guess also politically should resonate. Uh, and what you said also interesting, so to, to measure the success um, or to argue for and to argue for an ambitious climate policy to look at, at the impacts on air quality and then further down on health as a, a way of making that argument. Since, as you say, extreme weather, et cetera, we won't be able to, to demonstrate success there, but we can if we look at the impact on air quality and the resulting impacts on health and reducing those or minimizing those. Yeah, thank you. If Thanks. I may add to some of the th things that you have said, is uh, one of the innovative aspects of exhaustion is the use of different layers of, of data, uh, continental-wide, but uh, at, uh, to analyze uh, different mechanisms. Um, and so uh, this, this has allowed to, to, to uh, describe some of the drivers of the vulnerability. Uh, regarding to the issue of the data, uh, Given that we are in Brussels, I would like to say something about the um, that when we were trying to uh, estimate the heat-related mortality for the summer of 2022, we are were facing the fact that there was no format uh, homogeneous continental-wide data set uh, for Europe. Um, in early adapt, we are devoting one forward package in just knocking the door in all the national agencies for statistics and 
still with such amount of effort, uh, there are barriers that we cannot overcome and we are limited uh, regarding the representativity of the, of the different population subgroups, the countries, the resolutions, uh, periods, etc. And there is a limit for not only science but for uh, decision making and it's, uh, we're spending efforts in, in, in compiling uh, these data sets in different projects while this could be done uh, centralized by the, led by the mm. European Union or Eurostat or uh, one continental white institution. Um, but in, in exhaustion, it was, it, it was very nice to, to see how it was done in these three layers, uh, layers of data. And regarding another issue that I, I am originally a climate scientist and, um, and I was really uh, interested about how um, the atmospheric modeling was done in exhaustion. Um, how it was combined, the um, state-of-the-art um, epidemiology um, with the modeling of the different factors, different atmospheric factors, and this is a crucial thing. Um, and it also resonates with some of the ideas we're exploring in, in Catalyze and Early Adapt, for example, where the pollutants come from and, and to quantify to which extent these, uh, the health impacts are coming from locally from the same country, the same region, or coming from the country, um, the neighboring country. Uh, given that Europe is a set of very small, mostly small countries, and so uh, the policy making in one country, the neighboring country is affecting um, the, the, uh, the other ones. And so in, in, in early adapt, we are uh, analyzing, for example, uh, the health effects of ozone with regard to the contributions of the emissions in in other countries, and this would be a very nice follow-up for the work in exhaustion um, because the tools are the atmospheric modeling, the chemistry modeling, mm -hmm. and all the uh, outstanding epidemiological models are could be applied to to this also research. Okay, yeah, that's a, a good question. So you've, I guess, you've all highlighted what um, I guess where you see the strengths of the, the research to date and how those, how those can be used. And you said there's still some areas for improvement, like looking for a centrally collected data set, so data in a format that you can easily compile it and do something with it um, as, as researchers. Um, and then you've given an idea for, for a follow-up. So indeed, what, what other research is needed at this stage? Or do we say, you know, we've got what we need, it's now over to the policymakers to go and do something with it? Or are there... I guess, are there additional areas where knowing more could give the policymakers in turn stronger tools to, yeah, to argue and convince and ultimately, well, convince citizens um, to, uh, to support them in their, yeah. Uh, one, one area is uh, the development of early warning systems. Mm -hmm. The epidemiological models are uh, developed, um, even combining different environmental exposures, which is a a much uh, better way to estimate the health impacts. And so combining the, all these epidemiological models with forecasting tools, not only weather forecasting tools and mm -hmm. climate seasonal forecasts, but also er the new uh, um, air pollution forecasts that are available through CAMS, the mm -hmm. Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Service. It would be a very nice application of all the research that uh, mm -hmm. has, all the fantastic research that has been done in the in this project and we'll give the information, take into account the fires, air pollution, um, um, temperatures, heat and cold. Uh, we'll quant it, can, it has the power to quantify the impacts and, and not only based on the hazards themselves, which are the same for all the population, but um, customized uh, by population subgroups. So different warnings for men and women, mm -hmm. children, elderly, and um, poor people, people with pre-existing conditions, and this is super relevant for pollution, uh, for, for decision making. Okay. Yeah, Sarana. Yeah, um, we have, exhaustion has showed impact on mortality, which is ex of course extremely concerning, seeing that more people die on the days with heat and, and air pollution beyond effect, independent effects of these two exposures. We are concerned for our patients. We need to know also more, and I think project has plans to look beyond the project it, it, in other outcomes, hospitalization, exacerbations of existing disease. Is it asthma patients? Is it COVID patients that are most susceptible? Remember, this is not just susceptible older COVID patients, 
patients. Asthma is a lifelong disease. There are many children, young adults that suffer from asthma uh, uh, entire life. All our lungs are a little bit worsened by air pollution effects. So these extremely important parameters also for us to understand how heat, mm -hmm. air pollution, and, and their interaction so will beyond accept. beyond deaths and look at yes, impacts. Uh, hospitalizations, that, medications, yeah. use, yeah. extubation. We have new data now on, on COVID and infection linked with air pollution, interactions with heat and immune system, um, interactions with allergens and pollen and other relevant area for climate change. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are a number of things we need to go in detail and understand impacts beyond mortality and how can, for us always, how can we you know, no. educate our clinicians to help their patients and patients themselves to understand um, how to protect themselves. Which, as you said at the start, would, would further broaden the, 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 the relevance of this type of research and this type of policy making. Definitely. Um, I think we have enough evidence for policies, but no. we still need to go yeah. in more details for specific yeah. clinical areas to, yeah. to educate our clinicians to be able better to help their patients. Okay. And um, adding to this, for air pollution, we have learned over the decades that it's not just the lung and the heart, but that there is impact on the uh, reproductive system, that there are neurocognitive impacts. Um, that we now are, Sarana is spearheading work on cancer. Um, and so we have all these additional outcomes and it's very likely that this interaction between heat and air pollution is not just confined to these two organ systems for which you have nice um, evidence produced and the, the um, why this, these two organs are so kind of good working horses in a way is because they have both a very immediate outcomes, the triggering aspect and the long-term impact. And so if we now move to the other um, some more systemic impacts of these environmental um, joint effects, um, that's probably more difficult, but it's even much more relevant if we indeed could be showing that this is extending beyond um, the kind of what you have so nicely shown. And I think this would really have a lot of impact. And it's also, there, I think there's still a lot of work to do in convincing the medical communities that this is not some kind of add-on uh, which is ignorable, but that is really at the heart of future health. That this is determining the health of the next generations because the world will be different, it will be much hotter, um, and that, yes, the efforts are needed to treat diseases, but if we think of prevention, then addressing these environmental factors is really an important contribution. It's not a minor nice to have at on. I think this is really what is ahead of us, and I think it was just exhaustion that has nicely paved the way. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I, I think that sets a us up nicely for a bit of uh, discussion. Um, a thank you to our three panelists. Thank you. Um, so I realize you've, uh, we've heard from, from lots of people and what we wanted to do now, between now and the, the coffee break at 10.45, was give you a chance to digest and reflect a little bit on what you've heard. Um, so to kick that off, we thought we'd give you just a couple of minutes to speak to the person next to you. If no one's next to you, then scoot along and make sure someone is. <laughs> uh, speak to the people on either side of you. Um, can we get up some recommendations on the screen? So what we've tried to do too is distill obviously there were a lot of recommendations made by the various researchers this morning. We've tried to pick out uh, a couple of those. Uh, for thought, and what we wanted to do was ask you to lose this. Uh, what we wanted to do was get you to reflect on those. So initially, just for the people sat around you, um, and then what we'll do is bring it back to the plenary, and we'll get some input from those following us online. Those online, the next few minutes, you can grab a cup of coffee. You're not going to be here for our genuine, in real life, coffee break. So this is maybe a good moment to, to go and get a cup. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll have a, have a discussion here, and we'll end the discussion with a chance for you to input in writing via Mentimeter some concrete suggestions uh, centered on these recommendations, and ultimately uh, what you think uh, needs to happen next for 
uh, climate policy, air pollution, and health to be addressed as, as one whole. So take a few moments, uh, introduce yourselves to the people sat to your left and right, uh, have a read of the recommendations and exchange some ideas on what you think is important, what's missing, what needs to be amended. Is that working? Yeah. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your enthusiastic discussion. So we knew this was going to be a risk to actually get you stop, to stop talking again for just... Um, We've just got 10, 15 minutes to take us through to the, the coffee break, uh, where you're obviously welcome to continue your discussions. If we could get the recommendations back up on the screen. Uh, it was just the previous slide. If we can get those back up. We'll give it a second. What we wanted to do was take these 10, 15 minutes. Um, there we go to, well, to give the floor to you. Um, we can obviously see if anything's come in online, but since you're here, uh, who has, I guess, a reflection, a question? It's also the moment to take any questions to everyone you've heard from this morning. Um, so what we're looking to do is to, yeah, to take all the results we have from exhaustion and try and move that into the, the world of policy with some recommendations that hopefully become more and more concrete as we discuss them and refine them to actually see the results taken up into policy and ultimately acted upon. So does anyone have a, yeah, a comment? Do these look about right? Would you have expected something else? Do you say that you've got a recommendation also from your conversation just now that should be up here and you don't see here um, based on what you heard this morning? A reflection on what you heard this morning? Is it old news? Is it, um, has it made you think about things in a slightly different way? How do you relate that back to your own work? Is there anyone? We do have a microphone at the back that we can get to you ah, here. So is there anyone who, I suppose, has something to contribute based on what we've heard so far? Yeah, the lady there. And yeah, if you just tell us who you are and maybe stand up as you ask, then the online audience can follow you too. Go ahead. I have a comment to, to be clear. Um, my name is Christina. I'm working for the region of the Tyrol here in Brussels. Uh, it's an Austrian region that is surrounded by uh, Italy and uh, Germany in the heart of the Alps. Uh, we find ourselves uh, in the, in the, um, on a, in the main corridor, the transport corridor from the north to the south. And um, given our geographical circumstances and uh, the big industries that we are surrounded by, uh, air pollution is a very uh, big problem for, for our region and for uh, population. That's why I want to thank all the, the speakers um, for their, their, the data that they provide. It's, it's very important for us to also give this feedback to our policy makers um, because we heard from the representative from the DG uh, Envy, I think it was, he said that the um, health, um, the health um, imperative should be at the core of everything, but uh, unfortunately that's not the case. And uh, we also want to, to make that more clear in, in Brussels. And um, that's why, for instance, um, my region is working to shift um, the transport on rail. You, you, they want to, to they work on the, the shift from, from road traffic to, to rail. But unfortunately, at the moment, uh, transport on um, roads is cheaper. And although it sometimes it takes longer, but it's the cheapest um, solution. That's uh, why we're doing our fair share to, to prevent air pollution. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else with a yeah, comment? Gentleman here, just going to be patient for the microphone. We've only got one. My name is uh, Christian Hormans. I work for a, a Belgian uh, health insurance fund. Um, I have a, well, a, a suggestion. Um, we, we spoke about vulnerable groups. Um, words that I didn't hear today was the, the just transition. Um, so I would wonder if that is something to include the recommendation. Of course, we have to tackle the, the, the sources of air pollution. Uh, but there's also a, a task of protecting the vulnerable groups. And I don't only speak about people with chronic diseases, but also socioeconomic groups in cities. Um, 
without access to green zones uh, and who are often the victim of the, 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 the traffic and so on. Um, so that would be a suggestion to maybe link the topic also to the, the just transition debate. Okay, so to think about a, a wider definition or a more versatile definition of, of vulnerable, so it's not vulnerable only in the sense of uh, vulnerable to health impacts, uh, but also people in more precarious socioeconomic conditions. Uh, that's something we will look at in the second half of this morning as well, particularly research looking at vulnerable groups. But thank you very much. So anyone else? Yes, Miriam, so. We have a few uh, questions coming in from uh, online audience that I will uh, just take one. And that's, uh, uh, I just read it up. Can the speakers discuss inequities in the health burden from heat stress in cities, especially for economically disadvantaged? How can policy address this? And how about neighborhood scale interventions? Okay. So it follows on a little bit from the last suggestion we had. Is there someone from this morning who can give a response to that? Um, inequities in the heat burden um, on people in cities, notably disadvantaged people, and is there scope for thinking about neighborhood level intervention? Yep, go ahead. Well, you, you have to think about vulnerabilities um, in two perspectives. So it's one perspective is who is more exposed. And this is also dependent, for example, on socioeconomic factors. And the other one is who is more um, susceptible because of like um, disease conditions, chronic diseases. So it's um, both ways you have to think that. And um, of course, um, so we are currently performing a, a literature review on who is actually more vulnerable to heat exposure. And what we see there, it's not so easy to actually say who is more vulnerable because it's dependent on so many different factors. And so if, for example, you are um, old, that would make you more vulnerable. But then if you have better living conditions than others, that actually offsets your vulnerability. So it's, it, it's very complicated to actually define the perfect vulnerable groups that need uh, the perfectly fitted intervention. So I just, <laughs> so we are trying our best <laughs> to identify the ones and give recommendations, but it's, it's really difficult. Yeah, I guess this is uh, yeah giving giving substance to the idea of just transition is more difficult in in practice. Uh, and yet, as you pointed out, it's it's what everyone expects these days. But yeah, once you start looking at the detail, not so easy to identify who should be the priority uh, and why. Okay, thank you. If we got another thoughts or comment. Does everyone agree with what's up here? Is there anyone who doesn't agree or who says there's something major missing um, based on what we heard this morning? Is there anyone who thinks this is going to be, they agree, but they see massive implementation problems and actually delivering on any of these three? Yes. Thank you very much and good morning. Sophie Peru from uh, Heal. Congratulations, that's really, really timely and needed. And I would have, um, let's say, a, a point on costs, um, healthcare costs that are related to this, but also cost of inaction. Uh, because when we talk about, you know, prompting policymakers to be active, money is always a trigger. So I um, was just wondering, would it be possible to have really data clearly showing the cost of an action also for the healthcare uh, systems. Thanks. Yes. Hi, it's Catherine Wiley from the European Lung Foundation. Um, one of the things we talk about is the impact on vulnerable people uh, with pre-existing -condi pre conditions. Working with lung health patients, obviously air pollution and climate change are key issues to them. And one of the things that I always wonder is, how can we provide more evidence from patients to support the policies and support the policy makers? We know it's really impactful when the patient voice is heard and it's something that can really turn the public on to these issues. So 
we're here as a resource, really. I sort of want to say that. And what we can do to support your work and where we can engage more patients, please let me know. Also, a quick chambers plug. We have a patient conference on the 7th of December, which is around air pollution. And so if you want to join, you're all welcome. It's free, it's online. And it'll be an opportunity to hear patients talking about their experiences and also what they're doing themselves to mitigate the impacts of air pollution and climate change already. So thank you. Okay, uh, the lady just there and then, we'll go. yeah. I'm a part of the exhaustion project, so maybe I can answer the previous question that you asked. I think most of some of these topics will be taken up this afternoon, I think. But I think there is work in exhaustion already, and especially looking at empirical evidence. Unfortunately, not for all of Europe, but we've done the work in the UK and in Norway, looking at the uh, impact uh, on productivity health and productivity costs. So, and we have found that there is a significant impact of temperature, at least, on productivity, whether you measure productivity as uh, uh, cost of illness. So we've done some uh, analysis on cost of illness. We've also done some work on uh, absenteeism from work, whether that is affected by heat, and there is a significant impact, that much we can say, but it's not a European-wide study, so it's an empirical study in a small part of Europe. So, thank you. Okay. Yeah, the lady in red has been, yeah, the lady in red who's been waiting for a little while, and then Annette, and then, and then we're probably going to have to wrap up. <laughs> this always happens, people get going just <laughs> as we approach a break. <laughs> Go ahead. So th thank you very much. Francesca Ligi from the Recross U office. Uh, um, we, we absolutely agree and, and the topic is really um, timing. We would like to see advances also in the policy and operational implementation of uh, researches. But uh, uh, one, one element that is quite interesting uh, uh, from the sister uh, research NBEL was uh, the, the in, how we include the climate consideration for health workers in order to be able to collect data on the impact of climate change in patients. And this is related to the impact that actually health system have on the changing climate. Because health system are not so far uh, well behaving let's say in emissions uh, waste management uh, and uh, everything that impact the climate change so uh, i will turn the side on what health is doing for climate change including health workers voila okay thank you yeah so flipping it on its head that's a good point let's go to annette and then there was one more i think I just have a comment on the recommendation. Given the wonderful data you have, I would be actually much more clearer. Um, I would not say, I would say, we expect that ambient air quality directives will be changed. So they will not, they will not only reduce health effects and so to, and also their policies given that heat health action plans are underway, they need to, they not should. So I think it's really important to be really clear because the message, the, the recipients are not scientists. The recipients are people who need clear messages to, to really act on your wonderful results. And the, uh, my third comment is on the wildfires. I thought that the data was great, but it's 1% of the PM 2.5. And so I would actually call for having a joint assessment of the health impacts of wildfires uh, from a public health perspective, which is of which air pollution is one aspect. So this would be, um, I think it's important to keep the perspective there. But please be much bolder with your recommendations to be heard. Okay, thank you. So will rather than would and shall rather than should. Yes. The WHO Europe is currently updating their recommendations on heat health action plans. So this is also very timely to recommend something very clear. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we'll make that our final intervention. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Matteo Pinapintor. I am part of Exhaustion. I just would like to reinforce what my colleague Shilpa just said. Uh, concerning the cost issue and also wrapping up of what was said right now. I think it's important 
but I also think that the evidence that was presented today stands as a first motivation independently because we also need policymakers to facilitate more data collection on the cost themselves because looking at the economic consequence adds one layer of complexity, especially for what concerns uh, valuing okay, years of life, valuing productivity losses. So I think this is definitely important and we will see more this afternoon about it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. Can we get, so can we move from recommendations to Mentimeter? Can we get a slide up giving, telling us where we go? Um, and this is the opportunity for you to leave us with a written recommendation or comment on the recommendations. So you go to menti.com. Uh, the code you enter is 8360445. And this is the question we're asking you to answer. So it's basically, what was the title of the session uh, flipped on its head? What should be the priority, do you think, to minimize the health impacts of heat and air pollution combined? Um, we'll leave this open for a while. Um, what we wanted to do was, in addition to what, well, what you've said out loud, was to give those of you who haven't had a chance to speak, also people joining us online, uh, a chance to write in. It's free text, so you can write as much or as little as you like um, on how you would answer this question. As I say, it can be a, a specific comment on those three recommendations, or it can be broader, a reflection on what you heard this morning. Um, we'll give you just a, a few moments to do that, and then we'll let you escape for a cup of coffee. <laughs> Everybody has the ability to find solutions and should go out and look for them. Uh, and it's great to see that innovation is possible um, everywhere, every household, uh, all over the world. So we'll come back for the, the second part of today. So a little bit similar format to this morning, we're going to hear from another three presenters, results from the exhaustion project, then hopefully we're going to hear from the WHO, that will be a, a remote contribution. And then finally, we'll have some space again for you to give us your feedback uh, and for us to, to take some questions. Um, and all of that, we'll have some final reflections and all of that is going to basically take us through to, to lunch. So without further ado, I'd like to invite up our first speaker in this next series, Antonio Gasparini. Uh, professor of Biostatistics and Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, he leads the Environment and Health Modeling Lab there and is also co-director of the Center on Data Analytics and Statistical Science for Health. And I should say the second part, so we're moving away from the interaction of um, air pollution uh, and climate and health to focus on some of the questions we already had, the socioeconomic impacts, in particular vulnerable groups, impacts on productivity, this type of thing. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Very pleased to be here. So um, my presentation, if it works, It doesn't. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That's really nice. Uh, Okay, yes, thanks. Usual glitches. Okay, <clears throat> it's about presenting, um, let's say, the continuation of the work after, <clears throat> in particular, the work, from work package to that Alexander Schneider presented, and it's about the health impact assessment across the EU. So we, uh, the, the focus was on providing a historical and projected temperature-related excess mortality, and there are some important aspects. We wanted to be comprehensive, so we mapped a total of 854 cities in 30 countries, a collection of uh, uh, and linkage of uh, several sources of data, especially 
publicly available data, we'll come back to this later, and the provision of both heat and cold uh, related impacts, in particular on mortality, and this was very important in a way, especially for the projections. I will explain it in a while. Now, I won't go all through all the data we have used, but uh, we collected a lot of data. The mortality data come from the, um, um, the MCC, multi-country, multi-city collaborative network, but we matched this with many publicly available data. I'm talking about, for example, weather data from Copernicus, uh, projected temperature data from NASA, other environmental variables from other reanalysis data and remote sensing, and especially city-specific characteristics from Eurostat. And the availability of this data made this project possible. Now, I will give you a one-minute tutorial about how we do all of this from a statistical perspective. So you have already introduced it to this bit here, which is that these exposure response functions measuring how the risk changes a mortality depending on a temperature, in a way. And we refer also always to a, a reference point, which is the minimum mortality temperature, and the, of course the risk increases if you go above this temperature or below. Now, there's a temperature distribution here, and the idea is that knowing the temperature distribution and the related risks, we can estimate impacts for both the cold part or the heat part. Now, what happens now is that uh, the distribution of temperatures across the year is changing, is shifting towards a hotter part. And of course, the related, there are related changes in, in, uh, in uh, in the impacts, and of course, there is an expected decrease in cold related deaths and in, uh, expected increase in heat related deaths. And of course, this change depending on the shape of the function and also the type of moving distribution uh, that we have. And this is pretty much related to the issue of mitigation. Of course, if you, if you decrease the shift, uh, if you in a way limit the shift, uh, there will be less changes. Another part is, of course, adaptation, and we work in this uh, through changes in the so-called exposure response function. Therefore, if you attenuate the, the increase in risk, uh, of course, you have a decrease in the expected mortality later. So this is the framework. And what we did, we applied these exposure response functions. We estimated them across the board for age-specific. And therefore, we uh, got uh, an estimate of heat and cold related death rates by country. And the idea is that uh, you can see that there are huge variation, especially in the heat part, because of the differential vulnerability and the differential temperatures that you have across. And uh, uh, we can map them, and you can see that we have interesting results, especially for the heat part, there's a clearly a north to south gradient with south of Europe, uh, and this was already known, of course, uh, very badly affected by heat-related mortality, and uh, uh, an interesting picture of cold related mortality, in fact, with the east towards west, uh, let's say, gradient, in particular with uh, um, uh, Eastern Europe, very badly affected. So this was the setting for the analysis for the historical data. What we did later, we tried to project in the future. Now, in order to project in the future, of course, you need uh, to account for demographic and climatological changes, but also for vulnerability drivers and adaptation. And we have already discussed this. It's a very complex setting. And uh, the idea is that there are already some evidence that we have produced also in exhaustion. And again, Alexandra uh, presented this this morning. The idea is to model how the curve changes depending on some aspects. And in particular, in here is an example for population density. And there are some evidence on specific indicators. However, and this is a complementary analysis that is not part of the uh, assessment, uh, there are changes in time that are, can be explained by some mm, indicators. For example, this is an example for air conditioning explaining the contribution of air conditioning explaining the decrease in heat-related risk in the future. But this graph shows that most of the change is not explained by that indicator and actually is not explained at the moment by any indicator because, uh, again, vulnerability and, uh, uh, to heat and cold is still something that we are researching. Something very complex, also from a methodological uh, perspective, and the end point is that it's very difficult to translate specific uh, vulnerability uh, projections into 
policies, etc. Therefore, we started not doing it, and therefore we are projecting at the moment under no other type of scenario, and we got preliminary results. These are still unpublished, so I'm presenting this for the first time. And the idea was to see how in the future, heat, which is this line here, is not very visible, but it's red, uh, related mortality and cold related mortality changes in the future depending on different scenarios or combination of socioeconomic trends or pathways, let's say, and climatological pathways, going from a milder scenarios with optimal, let's say, socioeconomic development and limited emissions in the future to the more extreme one. And of course, uh, under the two, heat related mortality is always increasing, but more. Uh, extremely in the more extreme scenarios, and cold related mortality is doing the, the opposite. The interesting part of this is, is this so called net effect, because this was one of the sticking points in, in the presentation of the results that everybody says that the decrease in cold related mortality will offset increase in heat related mortality. This is actually not the case looking at our data, and even in the milder scenario, RCP 2.6 we have an increase in deaths, uh, the so-called net effect uh, in the future. And this is quite interesting uh, 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 mapping of this increase. And in particular, under the Malde scenario, south of Europe will be badly affected. I mean, we have an increase in mortality due to temperature because cold related mortality will not offset heat related mortality, the increase in heat related mortality, but this becomes more and more striking under more extreme scenarios in which other parts of Europe are badly affected. The exception is the northern countries, uh, UK included, but also the Scandinavian countries, etc., for which uh, we measure a slight decrease in net mortality in all the scenarios. But of course, across Europe, as you can see in the previous slide, uh, we have a uh, a definite increase in, 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 in deaths. Now, uh, the last part we wanted is to, is to, to show is, is about the, mm, providing this evidence also to uh, policymakers and everybody, and everybody else, because the idea is that we have tons of data, these are very difficult to read in a paper, etc. I wanted to make available to everybody. So we are developing these tools in which, uh, through which uh, you can select uh, the uh, spatial domain, city, country, regions, and there's different scenarios or different age groups, etc. And you can get for each city exactly the projections of impacts in the future. Now, I will conclude with some policy recommendations. I acknowledge that probably I'm not the best uh, person to do that uh, because I'm mostly focused on the research, but I try to, in a way, to distill some, some, some suggestions, and of course these are uh, probably a, a bit subjective. The, the first one is prioritize mitigation. Meaning, of course, we know that we can act through mitigation and adaptation. Adaptation is very important, but we know already from the data we get the adaptation alone cannot prevent big health uh, impacts. And therefore, the focus should be on policies on emission reduction. And this should be the, the focus of our, of our message in a way. The other one is evidence-based adaptation. As I said, we have a lot of results already, but uh, I wouldn't say anything is conclusive and it's still, still something we are researching. So it's important to design adaptation policies that are supported by strong scientific evidence and en encourage evaluation studies from the uh, policies we have already implemented. Another important point is to differentiate the kind of policies we are doing, because of course there are big policies EU level or country level, which are wide ranging, but it's also important to understand that uh, the risks and the impact they change from one city to one city and actually also within a city or within a region. And therefore, it's also important to act uh, with local interventions aimed at, uh, at risk areas or population subgroups. I finish with another important topic, which is invest in data infrastructure and research dissemination. Johan Ballester already mentioned this. All of this is possible because we have uh, publicly available and possibly free data available. There are, however, barriers that we need uh, probably to, to remove uh, in order for us uh, and for many others to access to the data uh, and, and also to, to um, provide the full research dissemination and, and output dissemination from, for these, uh, from these projects. So uh, thanks um, 
everybody and especially the, my colleagues in World Package 4, uh, we have collaborated on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I propose we'll leave any questions to the discussion bit we'll hopefully have time for uh, towards the end of the session. Thank you, Antonio, very interesting. Uh, and also a, a fresh challenge for EU solidarity going forward, as you showed that the regional impacts may be quite different uh, to the extent that we might see uh, an actual decrease in mortality up north and at the UK, it looked like, uh, but down south uh, in the meantime, um, the yeah the overall net impact is 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 very positive in term positive in sense of more deaths not positive uh, in any other sense um thank you very much for that also for the recommendations uh we move on then to lynn ma uh, an economist at cicero and she's someone who works on the economic impacts um of climate change and economic modeling and we're turning here to the i think the the health impacts under different socioeconomic uh, scenarios Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. And um, yeah, so, so my name is Lynn and uh, I'm very glad to uh, participate in this conference and excited to share some current uh, results on the social and economic consequences of health effects caused by climate change. I hope this presentation could help to answer some of the questions raised this morning. And this is the research I conducted together with Aspion Oheim uh, at Cicero. So before I go into the details of, uh, of our research, I would like to give some introduction, uh, con conceptual introduction. So, so the most standard approach for this economic assessment um, is using this bottom-up approach, um, which starts, usually starts from a micro-level study uh, on the individual health effects uh, in this project, for instance, and which uh, addressing this um, uh, climate change induced the health effect uh, on the individual uh, uh, person or hum human being. And then later this will be transferred into an intermediate level um, in terms of this effect on the uh, population. And um, finally, when you come to the macro level, uh, experts usually uh, evaluate this economic cost of impacts. This uh, usually includes for this uh, uh, project, for instance, includes the cost of productivity changes, a cost on the uh, health services, and also uh, there is also sometimes a more abstract uh, measurement on the welfare, which is uh, usually used as this um, statistical value of life. And in the end, by summing up all these um, uh, changes, uh, we can come up with this uh, change in the GDP uh, as an economic measure. So this bottom-up approach is really comprehensive. It moves from micro level to the macro level and is really good at evaluating this direct impact of uh, climate change, um, uh, also this, uh, on, the, on the health effects. But, uh, what, but when we talk about social economic consequences, there are much more or broader uh, aspects that we should consider about. So that's the reason why I would like to present our complementary method, which is a top-down approach for assessing the social economic uh, consequences. So what, what is this top-down method? So usually this top-down method starts from a very big picture. Um, it's like this um, macroeconomic environment, which including society or the whole economy into consideration. And then later it will drill drills down into more detailed sectors um, and also the as aspects from there. In the context of exhaustion project, we take into account this um, health impacts uh, through the uh, health services uh, changes in the cost and also the change in the productivity of labor. Uh, and also the, the mortality is also taken into account. So by considering this, what people's concern in terms of health and welfare, this will actually have an impact on the employment, unemployment in the labor market, and it will change the wages, and also have an impact on the uh, prices. Um, and all this will affect the trade uh, in the economy uh, uh, scope and uh, in the end have uh, if influences on the national uh, account, GDP. 
So therefore, by using this top-down uh, method, it could include way much broader um, uh, context or from different aspects, and uh, we can talk about this social economic consequences uh, more comprehensively. So, uh, another point I would like to address is this importance of considering different impacts from, uh, from different groups of people in the population. Um, for our researchers, uh, when assessing social economic consequences, we have to transform physical uh, measures into economic assessment. And traditional method of doing so is to use this standard value for a year of a person's life across the entire population. However, how the aggregate people is affected actually uh, depends on how different people within the aggregate are affected. So taking the uh, Italian data as an example, as shown in this chart, uh, this figure shows that how a single extra sick day due to climate change will influence the total number of sick days in the workforce as a whole. So uh, maybe you start to notice that as long as we start to uh, taking the um, group differences, age in blue, um, uh, age and gender differences in red, you will see there will be slightly differences from the case when we treat everyone the same uh, in light blue. Even though the differences are moderate, uh, small, but I think this is still uh, noteworthy to, or to be aware of. So therefore, by including group differences, I think we are able to get slightly closer to the assessment uh, at the micro level. Okay, so in our research, uh, we use this holistic top-down top method to assess the uh, health impact impact, uh, house effects due to climate change. What we use is that this macroeconomic model called GRACE and extended with the labor market module. Uh, in our uh, study, we use, we focus on three countries, UK, Italy, and Norway as a showcase. And we also induce uh, the health effect caused by climate change derived from the micro level data. This includes how the productivity of labor will change due to heat uh, temperatures and also how the cost of health care will be changed uh, due to the climate change. Most importantly, we also um, uh, consider these different impacts for different age and sex group of people in order to evaluate the aggregate consequences. Okay, so this is the figure or these are the figures showing the uh, projected impacts um, uh, by the year of 2050 under the SSP3 scenario. Okay, as you can see that um, due to the um, temperature change, labor productivity and health services will, uh, labor productivity will decrease and health services will have an increase. And uh, due to the lack of labor, the wage of labor will increase and also lead to changes in the consumption prices. Um, and also this increase of wage actually uh, induce an increase in the unemployment, and all this in, will have an impact on the trade balances and have final impacts on the GDP. Uh, what's interesting, what we find is that, I mean, this impact is different um, uh, from case to case for different countries. For taking uh, Italy as an example, we see that due to the extreme temperature change in the summer season in the country, the labor productivity in Italy uh, decreases uh, quite high or uh, have a largest decrease compared to the other countries. And this uh, leads to the highest increase of unemployment and um, how but there's an interesting uh, result that we show that due to the impacts on the trade balances, the impact on the GDP is really relatively low compared to Norway and UK. So therefore there is a diverse and uneven distribution uh, of, uh, of social economic impacts across different countries. So I think uh, this could, should draw special attention for policymakers. So, 
Finally, the three key, key takeaways I would like to address. First is that uh, a, a systematic macroeconomic top-down approach is really needed when evaluating this broad social economic impacts of climate change. Uh, secondly, when formulating policies or making decisions uh, at a macro level, it is very important to consider how individuals within a population are differently affected. At last, uh, from our analysis, we showed, we showed a very diverse and uneven social economic impacts of health effects due to the climate change uh, across different countries. Even though not fully revealing this, but to some extent, I think it, this shows that there is a potential distribution effect within Europe, and this should definitely be considered for policymakers. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, very, very interesting. Uh, and again, a real regional, as you suggested, the distributional challenge, a real regional um, uh, variation. Um, and I think, yeah, very clearly, I mean, you outlined what you did. So complementing the typical bottom up with a top down approach and looking at the, the climate induced health effects on various variables, health services and productivity, notably. Um, and yeah, very differing results and ultimately the inter final interpretation, not always obvious, as you showed for, for Italy, the GDP effects are finally not so massive, although there are the other indicators do suggest a massive detrimental impact. Thank you. Um, we carry on then with uh, the focus on productivity with Matteo Pina Pintor, a research associate in health economics at the Luxembourg Institute of Socioeconomic Research. Um, where he works on social determinants and the economic consequences of health with a focus on low and middle income countries. Um, and one of his areas is heat stress and labor productivity. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Slides, please. I am the typical bottom-up guy here. And um, I will, in the next few minutes, uh, tell you something about the experience of the part of uh, exhaustion that look into the effect of its stress on labor productivity. So uh, we obviously know that uh, this is increasingly recognized as an important determinant of uh, the economic damage of climate change. And uh, we know that the strain term regulation leads to morbidity and mortality. Uh, but there is also a nuance there. People also adjust to this uh, anticipated risk by regulating the economic activity. So we have to distinguish between uh, the adaptations, the consequences uh, mediated by health strains, and the responses of people that we might want to facilitate in this case. And uh, Richard Toll, the economist uh, looking and reviewing the literature in 2018, said that uh, as a social cost of carbon component, uh, that Heat stress, heat stress really has not been re receiving much attention and in the last few years there has been growing evidence but we think that when we reviewed the literature at the beginning we found substantial gaps. Uh, lots of the literature looks at specific occupational groups. Uh, there's lots of work on tropical countries for understandable reasons. Uh, and there's lots of work using uh, uh, conventional economic indicators of labor productivity. Uh, but we think that there is a missing occasion to look at a snapshot of the whole population, uh, to look at consequences at work, which may be fairly relevant for EU labor markets in temperate climates, okay? So we want to raise the bar here and look, okay, we have to understand what's going on in Europe. Uh, so we what did we do? We look at a country that is not necessarily well known for dry, warm, Mediterranean climate, uh, England and Wales. Uh, can we find something here? Are we missing some impacts to go under the radar because of the established methodologies? So we took as a source of health and socioeconomic data a very famous and rich, high quality uh, panel survey, the Understanding Society survey. If we look at 10 years, uh, we just isolate England and Wales. Uh, we look at presentism, which is a measure that in occupational medicine uh, is regarded as important, asking to people if they felt that they underperformed at work 
recently due to health reasons. And we try to see association with temperatures, okay? We use state-of-the-art reanalysis products. Uh, we have hourly temperatures for almost 35,000 small areas in England and Wales for 10 years. Uh, we link this temperature data to our socioeconomic survey in the recent weeks, just before people were interviewed and asked about presentees. And we use very many different indicators to capture the different dimensions of heat waste that might be uh, differentially building up the impact here. Uh, we run regression analysis that control for many differences between uh, the individuals who are exposed to heat waves and the control individuals which may not live in the same areas may have uh, different uh, characteristics, um, both ecologically and individually. And we also look at subgroup analysis. We are able to separate people into jobs that are usually characterized and defined by physiologists as sedentary and not very physically demanding, as opposed to physically demanding jobs. We also stratify for sex. And this, for example, tells you a bit uh, this is the annual distribution for one of the small areas. I think this is central London. Annual daily average temperatures, looking only at the working hours. And these are different indicators that look at the occurrence, the intensity by degrees exceeding the threshold, and the cumulative impact of continuous days in which the thresholds were met and exceeded to try to see if the continuousness of the heat waves is important, okay? And uh, what do we find? Well, we do find interesting and understandable results. For example, in here at the top left panel, we see that as the indicators, uh, as people are exposed to more severe heat stress uh, and temperature elevations, we find up to a doubling of the incidence of self-reported presenteism at work. But we also find the effect to be very clearly defined by those response relationship here in jobs that are usually considered to be sedentary jobs. So we did not expect it, we want to know why. And then we also saw some differences between men and women that we are currently unprepared to explain and to make sense of, okay? So we do find what we expect, in fact, an important effect, which cannot be found if we look at labor supply, if we look at how was worked, because these are people who did code work, but they felt that they underperformed, okay? So in summary, we do find that heat stress is associated to more than doubling of the incidence of presenteism, and there have been evaluations of the cost of presenteism in the literature that we can relate to this finding to compute some cost figures about it. But we also find that there are this group and heterogeneity of effects that we still cannot explain. We obviously have hypotheses. We can think that there might be differences in aspects of health that are adverse to people that are in sedentary jobs, they may be less able or trained to adapt individually or physiologically even to heat waves. Uh, but there might be also different ways of talking about your performance at work, so different reporting effects. And so even using this high quality survey, we see that there are some aspects of the data that really require further understanding, although we do see that there is an iceberg below the tip that we find. Our recommendations, therefore, are in line with what was already said previously. Um, we do think that the scope of estimating these kind of effects, which are probably very important in EU labor markets, uh, with general purpose data is quite limited and we need a dedicated data infrastructure to study heat stress costs, although we know the health effects. So heat waves are sparse in space and time. We need to oversample the populations immediately after the heat waves. Imagine studying a rare congenital condition with a random sample of the population without registries. You can't do it. You need to be there observing how the workforce reacts when the heat wave strikes. And you need to ask the right questions to workers, especially if you want to see what they do when they show up at work. You need to cross-check this and to complement this with data that is usually collected by firms but may not be used already. Um, you need to measure also variables that are currently not measured uh, to understand which are the vulnerable groups, which are the people that for ecological individual reasons uh, may not be 
um, facing conditions uh, that allow them to adapt properly to these impacts. Uh, and this data needs to be linkable, obviously, to pre-existing data, to data that already exists to make the best use of the already existing data. So the long-term solution for us is that you really have to set up an occupational heat stress surveillance system. So we have to have a degree of institutionalization to support research into understanding better the impacts that are already seen as being there, okay? We need routine surveys of firms and workers immediately after a heat spell. It just would not do to have the data that was collected for other reasons and opportunistically interrogate the data because then you end up with just asking for the surveys to just capture some part of the effect because it just so happens that people that were contacted were contacted immediately after a heat wave. This is an unrealistic approach to the research, I think. It brings you only at a certain point. We need ad hoc surveys still for vulnerable occupations. Uh, the people that bring our lunch uh, cycling on hot, polluted cities are an extremely vulnerable population, I think. Uh, we just need to uh, do something about it. I will be very clear about it. I think this is uh, an uh, occupational population that is understudied and yet is at the core of our daily lives. Third and final, this allows evidence base legislation on compensation, days off, and instructions to employers and employees. People have to be uh, told that these effects are understood by society, that the strategies to adapt are considered to be relevant, legitimate, and important. They are sanctioned by society. They, are, they should not be punished. They should not be stereotyped. They should be facilitated. Um, However, in order to have evidence-based legislation and adaptation, we also need, and that's my final message, policy-based evidence generation. That is, policy has really to come up and collaborate and take on the task of facilitating research better on these kind of impacts, because I think, as a matter of fact today, some of these impacts are going below the radar. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you uh, very much for that, and I guess um, introducing a potentially whole new field of research uh, and the fact that the impacts may be less dramatic, less visible, but in temperate climates too, uh, if they're affecting a whole lot of people in total, in terms of total impact on productivity, it may be a lot more substantial than anyone currently thinks. Uh, a lot of, yeah, a lot of room for additional research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, our next speaker is supposed to be from the WHO, but I see you shaking, Gunnel shake, shaking your head. Um, Maria Nero was supposed to be joining us. She's Director of Public Health, Environmental and Social Determinants of Health uh, at the WHO, but her agenda has been in flux today. She was originally going to be with us in the morning, um, and then she was available only later, and it looks like her agenda has changed once more. Um, she was going to be dialing in. She hasn't so far. So I think for the moment, we're going to park her, assuming she's, uh, she can't be with us right now. We'll see if she, um, yeah, if she does appear at some point, then we can squeeze her in. She was going to give us a, a WHO perspective, which obviously would, would be relevant, as we heard numerous times, that kind of setting the, the benchmark. Um, so it would be interesting to hear, too. And then they're in the midst of you know, updating their own recommendations um, what's feeding into that and how they see that exerting an influence on also European policy and the ambient air quality directive in particular. So we'll keep an eye out for her. Um, in the meantime, we'll move on then to, to repeat what we did this morning and give you a chance to briefly exchange amongst yourselves on a series of recommendations we take from these three preceding presentations. If we can get up the next list of recommendations, um, there should be just a couple of them again. So we'll get those up in a moment. Uh, and similarly to before, if you want to speak to the people sat around you, 
Um, we'll take, we don't have quite as much time in this session, but we'll take, say, five minutes after that to allow for uh, an exchange here in the room. And then finally, we'll give you a chance to input any thoughts into Mentimeter as well for the exhaustion organizers to take away with them um, and incorporate into the, the project's final output. Uh, perhaps I would say start discussing already. We'll get the recommendations up in a moment, but yeah, the idea is to kind of focus on the last three presentations we had. So particularly these socioeconomic impacts um, that come from health, uh, that come from the health effects of climate change. Um, what do you take away as important recommendations from that? And yeah, again, any ca any gaps, any things missing, anything. Um, areas for future research, uh, particularly recommendations for policymakers and how they take some of this information and incorporate it into policy are very welcome. So I would say go ahead and talk to the people next to you and we'll get something up here as soon as we are able. Uh. Uh. There we go, yes, yeah, so we've got the recommendations up there now, so you can have a read of those and then discuss amongst yourselves. <clears throat> oh, they're back. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. Um, is this still on? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so we can get that off now. Yeah. So we can see. Um, is it on or not the microphone? I think it is. Well, we'll see if. Um, yeah, if Maria dials in at some point. We will. We will manage. I think if she helps. So Eric is following the Zoom and then, yeah. It seems unlikely. Yeah, she'll appear now. I would have felt. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's good. We have a bit, yeah, we have a bit less time for this part. So. Go and ask them to put the recommendations back up. They keep disappearing. We should ask them to keep the slide back up, up for the moment. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Post like the recommendations in a document or something later. I think I think so. Yeah, I think it would be sensible. Yeah, yeah. Sorry? Okay, perfect. So should we take just five minutes? Okay, let's um Okay. Let's take um we'll take we'll take just 5 minutes, a couple of minutes for any immediate, I guess, feedback from your conversations, any immediate thoughts before we go to Mentimeter and give you a chance to um write in that feedback. Is there anyone with a reflection on these four recommendations and or from the conversations you've just had that you'd like to share with with the exhaustion project? Uh, somebody just asked whether we'd be putting these recommendations into a document and sharing them. Kristen, I assume we can do that? Yes. Yes, so you can get a, a copy of these after the, the event. Is there anyone? Yes, over there. Could we get a... Um, can we get a microphone to the gentleman just there? If you could stand up and introduce yourself, that would be great. Hello, hello, ah, hi. Um, my name's Kale Lawler. Uh, I work in global health in an NGO in Brussels here, or worked. Um, I just noted with the last presentation there, it was focused on physical health and, and the aspects of work, but I think that I don't exactly know the ins and outs of that survey, but I think mental health is also such a massive component of that now and also increasingly into the future, not just from the point of view. We had a brief discussion here about um, the effects of kind of climate anxiety and the effects of natural disasters, but also the effects on kind of social... Um, social violence and intimate partner violence and those sorts of issues in terms of heat waves as well, I think also would need to be captured in future occupational surveys. Um, I don't know what the status is at the moment, but that was just my initial thought from that. Thanks. Okay, good point. Um, I don't know, Matteo, if you want to come back briefly on that, and then we'll take another question or intervention. Yes, I cannot agree more with that. I think that puts an additional uh, demand in terms of uh, data infrastructure. Of course, we have to be careful. Uh, it's easy, especially from a researcher point of view, to ask for more data. Uh, we do have to make the case. Uh, I think there is a case also in that sense. These things can be put together. Uh, there may be an occasion to concentrate and therefore with a fi fixed amount of cost to have a good procedure to look at, uh, let's say, a holistic approach in health, in occupational health related to this. So we made an example and a proof of concept of what can be done right now and what could be done later on, just looking at uh, a simple measure that has been validated. But of course, this can, may well hold for other measures. Yeah, thank you. And then the gentleman just, just in front here. Yeah. I uh, just want to give a piece of information because data has, has becoming uh, is, is an important demand, uh, accessible data. Um, at this moment, the uh, European Union is working on the European health data space. So in a couple of weeks, normally, we will start trilogues. Uh, well, we, the Belgian presidency, <laughs> uh, 
uh, probably will um, lead trilogs on the European health data space, which means that in a couple of years, a uh, massive amount of health data uh, held by mutuals, hospitals, doctors, uh, institutes will be accessible uh, and exchangeable between member states. So I'm just giving that piece of information because there was a data infrastructure that was uh, on several slides. So normally in the future, there should be more easily accessible. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And a final comment from anyone? Do we have anything online, Miriam? That's, no, nothing worth sharing at this point. If not, I'd suggest we, we go to the Mentimeter, we go back to menti.com, if we can get the slide up again with a reminder of the code. Um, we'll give you just a few minutes before we go to our, our final panel to write in with your thoughts. Um, how can policymakers at different levels better take into account the health impacts and associated costs when designing climate policy? So this is again getting your feedback on the three presentations that led this session. And we'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. There we've got the first responses coming in. Looks like this one's requiring a bit more thought or a bit more typing. We'll leave it just another minute or two. Uh, panelists, if you'd like to start making your way up here already, you can do. Um, I'll get a chair ready too. Okay, I'll start introducing the panel. We'll leave the Mentimeter open. Um, so we've got coming up to 30 responses. Uh, so you can still feed into it um, for the remainder of the, of the session. Um, so we come then to a final panel discussion, um, which will be followed by reflections from another two experts. Um, so we're kind of coming up, trying to again funnel all this down into something usable for policymakers. So in this discussion, we've got three, three people for you. Um, Javi Lopez, uh, an MEP, so a member of the European Parliament. Um, he's been with the Parliament since 2014, um, comes from Spain, part of the S&D, so the Socialist Group. Uh, and very relevant to today is the Rapporteur on the Ambient Air Quality Directive um, in the Environment Committee. So we'll be leading the, the Parliament in those trilogue negotiations that we heard from Francois Wackenhut this morning 
are, are imminent, about to start. Then we've got uh, Clea Katsuyani, um, Professor Emeritus um, of the University of Athens, and also a professor at Imperial College London, Professor of Public Health, uh, with a background in mathematics, statistics, and epidemiology. So, welcome. And finally, uh, Sophie Peru, who you heard from earlier with a, a question, Health and Environment Advisor at HEAL. Uh, so that's the nonprofit Health and Environment Alliance here in Brussels. So basically coordinating all of HEAL's policy work um, and no doubt very actively involved, you're probably familiar with Javi, uh, very actively involved on air quality uh, as well as climate uh, policy and, and so forth. Uh, so I guess what I wanted to do here is uh, move away from, so we had two distinct sessions, one focused on climate, uh, the interaction between climate and air pollution uh, and how those two basically, and you end up with a, a worse impact on health when those two interact. And then just now we heard a little bit more about the socioeconomic um, costs of, um, of, of uh, the health impacts of climate change. We wanted to kind of broaden it out, out here um, and think a bit more about uh, equity. Um, as we saw, regional impacts are going to be very different. The co-benefits um, of climate action and action on air pollution. And I guess for each of you to relate these topics back to, well, back to what you currently work on. Um, Javi, I'd like to start with you. Um, I guess feel free to pick up on anything that has stood out to you, you think is, is interesting. What do you think is, well, the point of all this, the, the research project here, exhaustion was basically to provide a whole load of evidence that then feeds into policy making and theory makes it easier for someone like yourself to, to argue for an ambitious you know, air quality directive. I guess, is anything you've heard here useful? What kind of, I mean, when you go into these negotiations, what are you still looking for? Is there any kind of other support you can do with? Where for you are the big sticking points? Or do you say, you know, people get it, you know, air, air pollution, climate, health, you know, everyone's clear that those are interconnected and it makes sense to go for ambition. I guess a flavor of where we stand at the moment on the policy side. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I, well, my, my expertise on, on the discussion is as a reporter of the, I mean, the air quality directive and the conversations that we had and the discussion that we had in the parliament during the last years. What I would say, what is more important for us uh, and to win battles, because also this is uh, our goal, is framing. Framing, I would say, is the most important point to win the conversation. And for air quality, like which was the framing that we were trying to, to, to bring in the conversation. First of all, health, extreme, like it, it, extremely important for us, but for uh, health and for framing the, the conversation and the discussion about health, we need to a science-based approach. We need uh, data. Uh, for us, it was extremely helpful all the data that uh, the environmental um, U European Environmental uh, Agency uh, made on this topic, and that clearly says the message that um, air pollution is the biggest environmental threat for, for human health. And the data with 300,000 deaths per, um, direct or indirect per year, it was uh, extremely helpful, especially because uh, well, health is an important topic. But <laughs> Obviously, the public opinion after the pandemic and after COVID, it's more open to underline the policies um, oriented to protect health. Secondly, socioeconomic inequalities and so on. It was important to frame the discussion on this. Not for everybody is important, to be honest, <laughs> this. Uh, but for part of the parliament and the political spectrum, this is an important topic. And then it's not a discussion about like um, uh, air or only environmental discussion, this is, or not only health, it's uh, also a discussion about um, vulnerable people, low income, like all, no, we, all we are not breathing the same air, it's contra, no? And, and the neighbors uh, with low income, um, uh, of low income, um, 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 low incomes, uh, they are, um, well, this is affecting the life expectancy and, and so on. Uh, this was important to, to say, okay, this is a conversation about inequalities. Third, economy. Okay, Im important costs, 
because this is basically the argument used by the people that they don't want to move in the right direction, I would say. And trying to say, okay, um, and for this it was extremely important and useful, the commission uh, uh, studies made, okay, like if we reduce pollution, also we will reduce part of the cost that we have in the health court systems. And fourth, the environmental um, frame, that obviously pollution is damaging uh, our ecosystems. To be really honest, like I, I really believe in the, the fourth arguments, but to be really honest, the fourth it was the, the weakest in the, in the conversation. Well, we saw it, for example, in the NATO restoration law. No, um, like this is a, a, a huge problem, eh? the protection of our, of our biodiversity. But in politics and in the parliament, it was weaker than the other ones. Uh, because the ecosystems are not voting, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and, and, and we were trying to use four, these four arguments on the conversation and move on. Mm, the status now of the negotiations, and, and, and with this I will end my, my first inter intervention, we managed in the European Parliament to have a strong mandate for this. Um, we have a good proposal of the Commission, in my view, should be improved, can be improved in the trialogues, uh, but we managed to have a strong uh, mandate. And this was uh, good news, especially because the last year, in all the items um, of the big legislation of the European Green Deal, it's, it's happening something strange in terms of interinstitutional dialogue. Is that now the Parliament is having like less ambitious positions than the Commission. Theoretically, in this city, the games, the game is, okay, we have the proposal of the Commission, then the Parliament a little bit more, then the Council a little bit less, and well, we try to negotiate something. This is theoretically how it, how it works, the game. But like we are breaking the game. <laughs> Uh, the last year regarding the, Euro, the, the European Green Deal, with, with, with the, uh, the Parliament having less ambitious, ambition. Well, we managed to, to have more ambition uh, proposal regarding the standards, with a clear message about the World Health Organization guidelines, and then used science approach regarding monitoring, that it's a, a big topic, and obviously monitoring is linked with inequalities, regarding Enforcement, that is something that we have to improve, access to justice and, and uh, uh, so on. And then we have a good, a good uh, uh, proposal of the parliament. To have this mandate, like two key elements on, on that. First of all, like science accompanying us in our demand. And secondly, civil society. It was like we had during the conversations and the discussion a group of 15, 20 people really involved, I see some faces here, uh, advocating with the groups, uh, well, like it, it was three, um, uh, 400, 300, uh, the, 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 the last vote. And they played a key role in the conversation, moving the parliament in the right direction. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I can think of a, a few follow-up questions to that, but let's, let's come to the other panelists first. Um, Clea, do you want to give us some, some thoughts? So I, I want to say that I work for a very long time in uh, environmental epidemiology, especially air pollution, but also climate change. And I am part of exhaustion, so you should listen to my recommendations in view of this. Um, I, of course, agree that mitigating and decreasing air pollution levels will help with climate change adaptation and mitigation, but I don't want to be repetitive. So I'm not going to take this up again, although I completely agree with you. I, I want to say that when we actually show in exhaustion, and the exhaustion results are the first European-wide results providing such clear evidence on the synergy or on the interaction between air pollution and heat stress, which I think is important, actually you can see this the other way around. So when we have higher pollution, we, heat stress effects are more severe, and vice versa, when you have heat, air pollution effects are more severe. This has uh, consequences for the, the heat health watch warning systems that have been refer, uh, referred to before. And actually, it's not only about taking uh, into account the health effects, 
of air pollution when we have a heat wave, but it's also about taking emergency measures. So it used to be the case in some places in Europe that during a heat wave you would specifically target to lower air pollution, for example, by restricting traffic or by specifically implementing schemes to prevent forest fires during a heat wave. And this is not done anymore. So I think we should bring this back uh, into our discourse. And even though it may not be very politically attractive, I think it's something to mitigate health effects that is very targeted. And uh, it will, at the same time, um, prevent people from heat exposure through altering their behavior. So I think that's a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, the, we have a lot of evidence on the air pollution health effects, as many people mentioned here. But we shouldn't say we have all the evidence in place and we can now just do policy implementations. Actually, the synergies and the, the vulnerability factors are not so well understood. So there is ground for doing more work there. Mm -hmm. um, we have shown in the exhaustion results that some of the urban characteristics are associated with more heat stress and more mortality. But these are intercorrelated. So density, for example, um, um, uh, less green space, uh, low socioeconomic status are actually associated with them. They are associated to what we can call the urban factor. These independent and synergistic effects between these vulnerability factors are not well understood and we can have improvements there uh, via you know, further research and more targeted. One other issue that I think is important and we didn't mention it is actually um, at local and country level and European level, there have already been some mitigation and adaptation measures implemented. Even though they may be sparse, they may be uh, you know, uh, broken into like local uh, and not coordinated well, but there are. We don't, we don't fund the evaluation of these measures. I think we should evaluate these measures. We, we should look what has played a role. We understand that the population's uh, in Europe, react better to heat stress now. Mm. A little bit better. <laughs> Still, the effects are devastating, but they react a little bit better compared to two decades ago. What has played a role? Is it the information to the public? Is it the health watch warning system? Is it the change in housing characteristics, maybe changes in infrastructures, working environments? Is it changes in behavior from the population point of view? Is it physiological adaptation? These are things that we haven't evaluated and I think there is ground for going that way. And finally, I couldn't uh, support strongly enough all the recommendations that have been heard here this morning about data, provision of data, better data, uh, better access for researchers to data, better coordination. I was very glad to hear an improvement today. I think we really need that. Otherwise, we cannot do all these things that we recommend. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So mm -hmm. some very valuable additional recommendations, I think, mm -hmm. from Clea. From um, Sophie, do you want to, to come back? Maybe with a focus on the, the challenge of, yeah, of doing something with what we've got, the implementation, and getting this actually into policy and how you, how you see that. Yes, thank you so much. And I wanted to start by congratulating the two sides of the room. Because as you know, HEAL, um, the Health and Environment Alliance, we are actually working from the science to the policy. We, you know, do this bridging, so that's the right place for me to sit in between. And really big congratulations for all the science that is being produced because it is being conveyed to the policymakers, as you can see from today, as you could see this morning, by two really important representatives from the Commission. So you can really see that what you do is being heard, is being integrated and is being transformed into what? And that is the most important question. Political will. Political will is what uh, answers all those challenges. Uh, so the problem is not climate change. The problem is the failure to act on climate change, right? Exactly like with air pollution. And so this is uh, where I wanted to maybe try to summarize what was heard today so that really you take that away as, um, and convey to, to the parliamentary uh, team for the negotiation and also um, the, the council. Two key words, vulnerability, fairness. And uh, those two key words are really what we 
her, um, re we really hear from you and what we convey to, to the policy making about vulnerability. There has been a lot of talk about that, um, and really defining it is actually probably really important. It's not a minor thing. There is, I mean, we from HEAL, we look at many aspects of the vulnerability points, and we actually are very glad to see that the Parliament has taken a lot of that on board. Vulnerability is beyond control of the individuals. You don't decide. On air pollution, we are all vulnerable, and that's what your actually data keeps showing. So we are all vulnerable. Vulnerability um, evolves with our age. So all of us, at, at a certain point in our life, we are becoming more vulnerable. It also depends on socioeconomic status, and that is a key, really a key point, and I will come back to it in a second. Vulnerability also depends on your health condition. So that's very clearly something that needs to be really integrated into how we look at that. And what your data is showing from today, vulnerability also is depending on geography. And you don't necessarily decide where you live and where you were born and where you are going to work and where you are going to maybe become old. So these are all aspects that need to be addressed. So I will actually plea uh, to the policymakers based on what you are producing as science is please open the new policy age. That is a policy age where we do vulnerability-centered policies. But for the sake of what? And now I'll come to the inequalities point. For the sake of equity, for the sake of justice. And there are many reasons for that. Um, you, are very all, we are, you are all familiar um, with the fact that inequalities are the recipe for populism. And we are just, because, we are just before um, a very, very important EU election. I hope you are all aware when that is happening. If you're not aware, I will tell you. It's happening in June, uh, between the 6th and the 9th. And it's really, really important because all we are talking about, in the end, it's about what is the response and is the response going to be fair to all those uh, challenges. So this is completely, really important. Um, this is completely at the core of what we're trying to do. And now um, I come to air quality um, and the air quality directive. In the air quality directive, I want really to praise the work of your team, actually, uh, because you managed to get a really strong majority on a really strong mandate that could have been even stronger. Uh, that's always the case, because uh, as a health community, we were advocating for full alignment with the WHO guidelines by 2030. OK, you. Uh, proposing to end by 2035, that's one aspect, but you really rallied the majority, even from conservatives, and this is really important to highlight. And one aspect that really helped you know, people to understand what the topic is about is about health costs. So in the room, you have absolute experts about patient voices, about health insurers, and they calculate and they say, air pollution is impacting me, and I'm asking you to do this and that. And air pollution is also impacted like heat, the healthcare systems, and this is also something to be thinking about. We are in a moment in Europe where the health ministries, what are they talking about? They are talking about shortages. There is a shortage of workforce, and there is a shortage of medicines. And there is an increasing threat from the environment and from climate. So how do you work on this? You work on prevention, that's very clear. So now, on the core of the negotiation, we are very pleased uh, with the Parliament's position, with the exception I just mentioned. And I also would like probably to say it with a note of humour. Um, the other institution is the European Council. And it looks like this is an institution that is going through a childhood disease in terms of becoming really, really helpful. Because what is this institution proposing at the moment? They are proposing to punish the poor. They're proposing to punish the poor on air quality. And this is totally unacceptable. So there's one article in the AAQD that you need to absolutely have in your mind, because member states don't want you to have it in your mind, and that is Article 18. And that is the article, that the core article of postponing, of delaying the implementation of the new limit values. And one thing that is totally, totally unacceptable from the member states, that is completely cynical, that what they are saying in substance is, if you are a poor area, it's okay for you to not apply new limit values. So that absolutely needs to be reversed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to come back to, we'll take a few 
questions in a moment. I want to come back to Javi, though, because that's indeed what you ended on was a, a question that occurred to me, too. Like, if we, it's precisely because of fairness and, and taking account the different socioeconomic impacts that the council is arguing that there should be, um, in some instances, up to a 10-year delay. So I guess my question to you would be, you're also arguing uh, in favor of fairness and equity and the best possible outcome also for vulnerable people. How do you, how do you address that? I mean, how do you take that argument and how do you, what do you say to that? That it's because of socioeconomic realities that we should have an opportunity to postpone, um, which ultimately you would say is, is to the detriment of the people it's ostensibly to protect. So how do you, re how do you respond to that? Well, that it's again against of the basic ideas of Europe to have basically Europe, no? I was, like you was explaining, this, uh, this flexibility that is crazy, no? For economic reasons, you can, uh, you can have worse uh, air quality than health. I was thinking in, in Nutella, I, do you know if, if you know this story? Nutella, why? Because like, Nutella was selling different chocolates um, across Europe. And in some countries, like worse chocolates. Okay, uh, worse chocolates, uh, mm, more sugar, um, and worse for the health. And these, are, these arrived to the European courts. Uh, the case, I think, it was being by Croatia. Uh, this arrived to the, to the uh, and the parliament was pushing on this. You know, like, well, if we have the single market, you cannot sell like different qualities related to health to all the consumers. No? Well, it, it makes sense. No, completely. And the court decided to like, you cannot be Nutella and sell different products, uh, like the same product with different qualities that is affecting differently your health. Good. But then like we are able to have legislation saying that some zones, like for socioeconomic reasons, you are able to breathe worst um, uh, air, air quality and, and pollution. Well, this makes no sense. And we have to try to explain that basically the idea of Europe is to have universal rules that apply to everybody because we are creating a European citizenship. And this is the point, no? Okay, okay. Um, I've got a few more questions, but I wanted to see if anyone else has a... You do? Yeah, a question. If we could get a, a microphone. Yes. Hold on, we'll get it to you in a, in a second. It's okay, it's because there's people online too, so for them to be able to share in your question, if you just tell us who you are as well. Uh, Maurizio Maggiore, DG Research uh, European Commission. Uh, I, I'm sorry that I had another engagement, so I arrived late, but uh, I think I, I caught uh, an important point. And I wanted to stress the, you did it uh, in my place for the social, uh, which is unbelievable. <laughs> but uh, another thing which I think is a kind of elephant in the room, and if you need the uh, substance for the costs, for health costs and so on, I think uh, it's uh, under, uh, underrepresented for good reasons, because simply we don't know. But uh, it's uh, uh, ultrafine particles. Basically, when you say there is an evaluation of the cost, it's not considering, as far as I know, the long-term effects, uh, first of all, Basically, we know the particles get into the bloodstream, we know that they get into the brain, and this is recent, more recent, uh, but we don't have the data because nobody or very few are measuring ultrafine particles, and uh, uh, therefore we cannot say with certainty, but we have a lot of hints uh, that they are bad. And therefore, this is really the bottom. It will be more. And, uh, if you are interested, we launch projects uh, on uh, uh, brain effects, for instance, a and that's a very high cost because you don't die, but you basically are uh, uh, almost and need uh, care and so on. So the costs for that uh, are, are very high. Uh, we have launched projects on uh, nanoparticle emission by all transport uh, means. And you see that uh, ships, uh, airplanes, and so on. I mean, we are concentrating on cars, and there are good reasons for that, but uh, there's much more. And uh, at the moment, we don't even, I mean, we have launched projects on having a measurement station for ultrafines and so on. So I think uh, if you need arguments to say it's at least this, and probably much more, this, I think, should be put more into focus because uh, we uh, seem to, to forget it. 
Thank you. Yeah, that, that um, echoes some of the, the recommendations that were made earlier were indeed to, so to look, for example, at the impact of labor productivity, even in, in temperate climates where um, it might be very small, but it's affecting a lot of people, and also to think indeed beyond morbidity and mortality to, to much broader implications, which then makes uh, air, quali um, air pollution and how it interacts with climate change uh, a more relevant issue to a much greater number of people. Um, yeah, so it dovetails yeah, it, with in that. In the end, there is precautionary principle. We have yeah. it. We should yeah. use it. So anyone else who has a comment or a question do we have anything from our online audience, Miriam, at this stage, if you want to give us a flavor of that? Let's take that, and then I'll give you a chance to respond. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have a question here uh, from the Norwegian Association for Green Infrastructure. They are wondering, how do the speakers expect compliance with the nature restoration law to influence urban heat stress? And can the metrics for monitoring compliance be informed to benefit health objectives? Okay, you wanted to come back, Clea, on not necessarily on that question. I but wanted to make a yeah. comment. When we talk, you talk about equity throughout Europe, which I think I completely agree, sometimes this also brings to European solidarity. So there have to be some funding rearrangement to help those places which will have problems implementing the directive more than others. Is that in your logic? That's my question to you. <laughs> yes, yes, like, and, and to be honest, like we should try to don't have only uh, like an stick also carrots and support the, the the local governments and the regional governments that they will want to move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But, you no, know, and this is like, one of the problems is like, uh, how manage this with the principle of subsidiarity? <laughs> because like, what we can do is basically standards, mm -hmm. no, in the EU. Standards and enforcement and control of the standards. But like, low emission zones, like, we cannot, to zero emission zones, we cannot approve here. No, or a mandate for that. And the point is how to manage to, in my view, to have political support um, and resources to the local governments and the regional governments that they want to move in the right direction. We've got one more question. Do you want to pick up first, Sophie, on the question about the nature restoration law and whether that could help yeah, heat so stress? Thank you. Um, actually, I wanted to come back a little bit to the question of what do we do with the regions where there are most needs? Because ultimately, this is where it boils to, right? Um, so to answer the... Well, first, we need to recognize that some regions have more needs than others. You can reverse the question and saying some are more privileged. You know, it really depends on, on your perspective. Uh, but the answer to this can never, never, never be delaying action. It can only be increasing action and especially the funding. Um, and so that, that is a very key point because if ever you hear the, this you know, narrative about, yeah, but there are specific needs, well, then put up specific budgets. And those budgets exist. So I actually wanted to highlight this because in, in this discussion, mm -hmm. uh, what the commission has been constantly saying, and I think the commissioner himself in the council, he said it again, the budget exists, the money is there, it needs to be used. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the EU nature restoration law, can you say a quick word on that? Do you see any scope for that to help? No, we need, a, we need an EU nature restoration law expert on the panel for that. Um, but it's, a good, it's an interesting thought, indeed, as we focus more on nature and as we saw things like green spaces and so on, all of these are factors in vulnerability, I can imagine, well, intuitively, logically, there, there should be an impact, a positive impact um, in, in benefiting health. Um, so one, yeah, one to look into. We've got two hands up. If we take those two, and those will pretty, uh, have to be our final interventions, I think. So we'll take both of them and then come back to you for a final response. Yeah. yeah hello, I'm uh, Michael Skarnesen from uh, Denmark and also part of the um, project team. Uh, I'm very surprised about this uh, extension, 10-year extension, and especially the argument. Uh, and um, 
I think it goes completely against uh, the European spirit about the single market and also the need for uh, cohesion and equity. Um, but I think if the British had still been been uh, with us, uh, they would have said uh, we should at least demonstrate with some socio-economic analysis uh, that uh, it would make sense to give any exemptions. And we know that this opposition, it comes from EPP and it comes from the right side and they're usually um, somehow attentive to economic arguments. And I feel pretty sure that if you could build in some kind of socio-economic mechanism that member states must demonstrate that this would make sense, I think they would all fail because we have the cost figures showing the costs of, of air pollution. So that's a suggestion for you to consider. But also a question about uh, where does this really come from? Uh, yeah. Thank you. And the gentleman just next door. Hello, uh, this is Panagiotis Haslari, this is from the European Federation of Allergy and Airways Diseases Patients Association. I would like just to uh, draw uh, the attention of the panel and the rest to the importance of an informed public as well uh, in regards to uh, quality matters. This is not just a fundamental right, actually this is also a preventative measure once you know the uh, uh, pollution levels of your immediate uh, surrounding area, uh, then you can really adapt your behavior depending on your condition uh, and your uh, vulnerability. It's actually uh, a key point that we have seen. Uh, you have highlighted uh, in the past, uh, Mr. Lopez, uh, because you have uh, I'm said, I'm quoting, that who would be against an informed public? That, that's going to be an easy win, and we are very happy that you have fought really hard on, on that. On the cancel uh, position, we have seen uh, wording slightly being watered down or weakened, so we really expect that uh, 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 there's going to be a good fight uh, on, this, on this matter. Uh, and I'm sure that this is something that is echoed around this room because one of the key uh, missions of projects like the exhaustion project is to uh, uh, develop evidence uh, that arrives in a, a, a lay language both to the policymakers, but also to the broader public. Uh, thanks, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we, we don't have time to take more interventions. I'm sorry to both of you, but our, I don't know whether, I guess, but I don't know if Javier, you have time to stick around after this, but there is a lunch after, so I would suggest you approach the speakers directly if you've got more questions. A final quick takeaway from, from each of you in response to what we just heard. Um, I guess what to, what to look ahead to now. Let's start at this end this time, and we'll end with Javi. Go ahead. Okay, there's one thing to remember about the costs. Yeah. Delays are irrational from an economic perspective. I'm not saying this. The Commission is saying this. The Commission's impact assessment is showing absolutely clearly that in all scenarios, including full alignment by 2030, cost of inaction is higher than cost of action. So the those, those voices that are asking for delays are actually economically irrational. Thank you. Uh, well, I just want to say that uh, I'm very glad to see that science is used in policy making. I think this is something we have moved a very long way since I have started to work in this area. I'm very glad to see that and I'm also very glad to see the exhaustion project being used in such a constructive way. And I hope this happens outside of the room as well, because here we are a bunch of interested people. I hope it happens. It's more widespread as we move along. <laughs> yeah. Well, a couple of comments. Um, first of all, public information. I think this, this has to be a, a big battle in the negotiations, and it makes completely sense that we, as a parliament, we push on this, uh, because more public information, it's more awareness, um, more awareness, it's, it's, it's citizenship more demanding with the institutions, and this is a key element. Uh, and theoretically, it should not be super difficult to pass things on this, on this uh, direction. Yes. And secondly, who opposed it? No? This is a really interesting question. Um, like in general terms, uh, like the progressives, we are more sensitive with this, uh, and the conservatives, they are less sensitive, I will say. But it's not so automatic. Eh? 
Um, to be honest, if you see like the, the, the countries and the negotiations in the council who were like pushing more uh, on the right direction, basically was, well, uh, Spain, Belgium, Denmark, Czech Republic. Uh, like, mm. I, it's not so automatic. Um, um, uh, we had one abstention and I think one vote against. The abstention that it was not enough, like it was too much, the proposal of the council, it was Germany. Like, and the reason is how they frame the discussion, I think, in their countries and in their administrations. Well, probably the coalition in Germany has a lot to do with that. But, but it's more difficult uh, than an automatic discussion. And for this reason, it's really important to use science, to use the cost, uh, because always there is the argument, the mm -hmm. counter argument. Well, it's not clear this data. It's not clear. This, it's always this, and it, like mm -hmm. ten datas are always better than one, and one hundred are always better than ten. Okay, thank you, thank you for the reality check, but nonetheless ending on a, a note of optimism. Um, a round of applause for our panel. Welcome to take a seat down below. Um, and that leaves me to introduce just two final speakers before I hand over to, to Kristen to, to close today's event. Um, I wanted to invite up Peter Loeffler and Francesca Ligi. Uh, so Peter is a policy officer in the Adaptation Resilience to Climate Change Unit at DG Klima. I presume that means you're working with, uh, you can stand if you like, as you wish. Um, I presume that means you're working with Elina, who we heard from this morning, Elina Bardrum. Um, and Francesca Ligi um, has been with the Red Cross since she was 17 and is now working at the Red Cross EU office, uh, representing the National Red Cross Societies uh, in the EU, Norway and Iceland, uh, also the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. So we wanted to, we hoped that we, I realize we've been through a lot, but what we ideally wanted was for the two of you to leave us with some final reflections that uh, together with all the input we've accumulated today will feed into and shape uh, exhaustion's final written output. Um, once we've heard from you, I'll hand over to, to Kristen to, to close. So go ahead, feel free to share the floor as you see fit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so very interesting discussion. We can see really that the research is developing uh, uh, more and more the, the interlinkages between health and climate. And we are very happy with that. Um, let me say that we work with uh, operational evidences uh, from uh, our members uh, in in all over the world, uh, feeding our policy, our policy and advocacy work here in Brussels. Uh, but research uh, is a key component for us, as it should be for uh, policy making. So the first thing is that um, uh, through the exhaust exhaustion project is focusing on air quality um, and eat, but uh, we noticed that the impact of climate change on health uh, uh, is such huge and touch upon so many different uh, aspects of human, animal and planet health that no. there should be um, more uh, correlation between all these aspects because we uh, work for now on a sectorial basis but we really uh, have to look at the bigger picture. And uh, on the subsidiary role that the EU has on climate, I will make an, uh, a point on the fact that it has a subsidiary role also on health. So uh, how we uh, translate EU recommendation uh, into national policies uh, is to be seen also when it comes to health. Then I, I, I try to sum up uh, all the discussion uh, very briefly uh, from local to global, as uh, we, we do usually, and uh, make the first point on the most vulnerable. Um, for us, is key having access to health and social uh, care system, because all the discussion on data, all the discussion on evaluation, how we can collect data, provide care, and evaluate what is working or not, if the people most affected do doesn't have access uh, 
to the to the systems. So this is the the main point, including with the. Uh, regards to the legal status, I heard a lot about the socio-economic condition, but not much on the legal status of the people that do not have access to the health and care system. Then we move to the communities uh, as broad, and uh, uh, the point on raise awareness, public communication, risk communication is very key, including in municipalities, city planning, and uh, for instance, uh, uh, changing behaviors, and the point on mental health and psychosocial support for the communities with, uh, in relation to climate and health consequences. Then, a point on uh, the, um, the knowledge of health and climate workers, uh, uh, trainings, capacity building in how to detect and recognize uh, the, the effect, uh, the impact of climate change on health is key. We see that when we work with our uh, members, uh, uh, the health workers uh, have a very sectorial approach as well as the climate uh, or the disaster management workers. So this this is very keen and do not forget the mental health and psychological support for those responding to climate induced crisis that is also a key element then the last two and i will conclude that is, they are quite related, uh, is for the private sector and the economy. All the discussion on the cost and benefits remind me the discussion around loss and damage that we have for climate change. Why not uh, including health? human, animal and planet elements in the loss and damage discussion and uh, really apply uh, common standards as I said and this is including of course for the member state that is the last point the decision makers um, that have really to translate into policy and operational framework what the research is saying. There's no time to wait for additional research. We have uh, enough materials to start implementing policies, including everything that is regarding climate finance uh, for health adaptation. And as we discuss, uh, health uh, systems that are resilient uh, and environmentally sustainable. So that was the last point. To conclude, uh, and uh, it's the perfect transition for the, 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 the concluding remarks, is coming from the e, uh, European Green Deal. There's a very little sentence that say, only by setting an incredible example, the EU can be an effective advocate. And this is in a EU text already approved, already in implementation. So I think this resumes perfectly what is need to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca, and uh, many thanks for giving me this uh, sweet spot. And I'm aware I'm between you and your lunch now, okay? So, um, when I was initially in touch with Cornell uh, about what to say, uh, she suggested I could say something about uh, what does um, exhaustion mean for uh, the development of a, of a future EU research agenda on climate and health. But that's not really my job. I'm from DG Klima, and we have actually the colleagues from DG Research working on that field and organizing a big conference next year, 19th and 20th of February, to precisely do that, to shape the future research agenda on climate and health. So do take note of that conference, attend it, you know, make your arguments there, uh, and I think that's the way to go. Um, from sort of a DG Klima perspective, and you heard my director speaking uh, earlier this, uh, this, this uh, today, um, I can really say this was, uh, it was worth attending this conference. I was really glad here. I took three pages of dense notes, which I will share with many colleagues, not just from my DGOs, but also from other DGs, because we do work across uh, many DGs uh, on, on the, these agendas. And, and really, your conference was on you know, climate, air, and, and the health triangle, and, and the sense of interdisciplinarity and interconnectedness and on our side of policy convergence, I think, is something which is really uh, on the rise um, uh, a lot. And in recent years, we had the Budapest conference earlier this year uh, on, on environment and health with some uh, important national commitments being made. Just yesterday, I was at the One Health conference in Luxembourg, organized by the colleagues from DG Santé. And let me tell you that I'm in daily contact with the colleagues from DG Santé on several climate and health-related uh, files. 
And of course, we have the COP28 health day, the first ever health day of a climate COP with the uh, related ministerial meeting and ministerial decision there. So this, I think, is definitely something which is, uh, you know, we has been growing a lot, and I, I cannot see this going away, because it makes a lot of sense, as you say, you know, uh, climate uh, health, climate mitigation, climate adaptation, air pollution, also biodiversity, you know, uh, it is it is connected. Now on climate policy initiatives, uh, I think two relevant initiatives, I think, where exhaustion really um, can make a difference, and I did take note, is uh, one, uh, the, um, we are working on the 2040 targets, the intermediate targets for, uh, and you know, Europe's way to become climate neutral. The impact assessment, the impact assessment will have a chapter on health, you know, how do the different mitigation scenarios, what do they do for health? Uh, and I think some of your findings are totally relevant here. Uh, secondly, uh, Elena, my director, spoke this morning about the EU climate risk assessment. It's a major piece of work. Uh, we will look at the big systematic compound risks which the EU is facing due to climate change. There will be a big aspect on health on that. There will be a communication, communication with a sort of political take from that risk uh, assessment, which the uh, European Environment Agency will, will, will develop for us. Um, and again, um, you know, uh, several of your findings, figures, facts uh, are, I think, important here. Um, now, this is big policy. I think, you know, we also need to move from big policy to action. Um, and there's a lot of groundwork and legwork to, to be done. You know, in research, you will say, take the research from the lab to the field. And, and this is the same for policy, you know. The regulations got to be implemented. Um, and I think there are several initiatives which are really also relevant. Um, we have the European Climate and Health Observatory, which is our sort of knowledge clearinghouse and increasingly also a capacity building tool at the sort of climate health interface. Uh, we have next week, and I, I, I was really struck by, by uh, the, the importance of wildfires and air pollution. I was working on wildfires in the past. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't really aware just how big the, the, the impact on air pollution is. We have next week the meeting of the EU expert group for forest fires um, here in Brussels. And I think, you know, your findings are really relevant for that group. So we'll, we'll try and take them there. Um, we have the colleagues from DG ECHO working on the Wildfire Prevention Action Plan because wildfires are on the rise. And again, there's a health aspect which I think you helped to uncover. Um, we have uh, a lot of work that needs to play, take place in cities, you know, 80%, 70, 80%, uh, 75, 80% of Europeans living there. Um, people suffer from heat and air pollution in a local context, in a, in a place, uh, so cities are important. And again, we've got our mission on adaptation to climate change, uh, we've got the covenant of mayors and a lot of work on cities. So I think these are all sort of pathways where the knowledge which you created in exhaustion, you know, is being brought to good use. And in terms of the, the communication mechanisms, we had a quick exchange with Christine, you know, what works for us, and we are a few and mostly busy people. I think your policy briefs are really good, they are short, they are to the point, they're useful. An event like today is an invaluable opportunity, face-to-face, -face, meeting people, discussing. Um, so, and I'd just invite you to, to attend also forthcoming meetings and, and, and opportunities to, to, to liaise with us. Um, and uh, the language of your recommendations, I really liked it. I think it's a, it's a language which works for us, which I think is meaningful and which we can almost copy-paste and send to someone within the Commission. So many thanks for all your work. Uh, thanks for having me. And um, I think I give now back to Sonia for her final words and then over to lunch. Thank you. That was great. Uh, thank you very much for that, Peter. It's very nicely connected the circle back to back to Elina this morning and some very tangible, yeah, your examples of uh, very tangible places where you can take these results and where they can hopefully uh, make a difference. So that's great to hear. So anyone who had the question over, you know, this is all great. Uh, as Cleo said, you know, are we pre preaching to the converted in this room? Well, uh, there's at least some people in this room who are going to be taking these results out into the wider policymaking world. Um, Kristen's going to close for us in a moment. We wanted to invite you back to Mentimeter one final time for a word cloud. You just heard Peter's takeaways, uh, you heard Francesca's takeaways. What is your key takeaway from this conference? And the idea is to keep it short. We've got your more detailed responses already uh, in, um, in answer to those previous questions. Here, the idea is literally put in a word or two, and um, it'll give us a nice visual to, to come away with. I don't know, Kristen, if you want to come up already and start your final part. I know we have 
one more surprise in store for you. But this is going to stay open. The idea is we can maybe come back to it, actually, after, um, at the very end, after you've spoken and see what's come in. Um, so we'll leave it. Yeah, we'll leave it up. Let's leave it up there and we'll see what comes in. Thanks a lot. So I will be brief. Time is up. But um, I'd just like to thank the audience who have participated in this event, uh, from the speakers to the panelists, everyone who has contributed to um, making inputs uh, like these Mentimeters and other things. So, uh, and I really hope that we have been able to convey the f outputs from our project in an understandable way. Um, so far, my impression is that we have at least succeeded to some extent, although we might need to sharpen our recommendations a bit. <laughs> that was one advice, uh, and we'll definitely look into fine-tuning those uh, kind of main messages and, uh, mess and uh, recommendations coming out from our project. So that's a lot of interesting words coming in. Action is central here, I see, which is, of course, very important. That's why we're doing our research. Uh, we wanted to have impact in terms of policies and action. So we really hope that um, this project uh, will uh, contribute to, uh, to uh, helping the policymakers, you in the room and outside this room, uh, for different types of uh, policies related to air pollution. Of course, this air quality directive is very topical right now, but we have uh, climate change is uh, the overwhelming. Um, challenge uh, for us, of course, uh, and it's not a quick fix. We need to do everything. Uh, we need to mitigate and we need to adapt to the changes that will come, um, even though we, we could be able to shut down greenhouse gases tomorrow. Uh, we know that uh, there's a lot of uh, impacts in the pipeline that we need to um, consider and adapt to and make uh, people uh, resistant and our communities able to cope with uh, different threats that are already there and will be stronger if we fail uh, to limit the greenhouse gas emissions. So um, I think actually I will stop there. And again, thanks to everyone. It's really valuable to have this kind of event for us to get out and understand what, uh, how our messages are received and how they might be used. So. Um, Thank you, everyone. And as a final thing, we will show, we showed previously one uh, video that we are, have made that we now close with uh, showing another type of uh, video. It's um, uh, so-called uh, slam poetry or spoken word um, by um, Uda Auna. So if you can put on the breath video. That's the final. And we have lunch together afterwards, so we can keep chatting. Thanks a lot, everyone. to breathe, to live, yes, to surrender, let go, no, so we fight, we are the youth waiting to grow up, we also want to experience the light, we want to dance with our lungs filled with fresh air, but we see our painted future, no clean air is left to breathe there, so we fight, we know that even under the midnight sun, there is a night. A matter you might like to ignore Or oh, to change direction can be such a bore More tempting to hide behind a familiar door Don't you wish for more? We do So we fight Dreaming of a world in symbiosis We dress up in armors made of leaves from trees and collected shells We don't carry bullets, our hope is our weapon It's stored in our cells We say our farewells to a childhood Disappearing into an adult world there is no clear line here. Every truth has been curled, hidden behind photoshopped images of stylized nature and bureaucracy. They call it vision. We see hypocrisy.
cut some carbon while searching for oil. Promises of wealth made standing on the dry cracked soil. Our sight is blocked by factory, up on factory, up on factory. Ignorance produces ignorance, but we want to see what it means to breathe in heat waves and uncontrollable fires. What it means in a world that so quickly expires. Our body's young, but our souls are old. They hold the wisdom we should cherish as gold. Not everything in life can be controlled. Not everything that shines is the treasure. Not everything bought can bring you pleasure. But if capitalism needs are constructed needs to grow, do you think it cares about fresh air as long as it got monies to sow? Does it care if your water makes you ill? Watch out if the value of life only comes in a pill. There is already so much human-made misery. What we could become is not what we will be if we keep adding to that list. Less plants. More fear. More tired lungs gasping for air, bodies lying in hospitals and not in spring flower fields. What it means to breathe. Somehow in the rush to success we forget we also are a seed. We need nature more than nature needs us. So we fight, unarmed. We are not charmed by consumerism and everything is half price, half nice, half real. Swallow this deal. Our gaze is fixed to watch the future burning. You say, forget your dream. But our bodies are yearning, left hungry to rediscover that hope in the dark. What it means to breathe. To live, yes. To surrender, no, or maybe yes if it means giving in to something more powerful than you. To let nature pass through your body is like an internal tattoo, it's your secret honeydew that gives you a field of view. To watch something grow from minuscule to big. To watch the first sign of green emerging from a dry twig. To take a bite from a luscious fig plucked from a tree. This tiny sensation that makes you feel heavenly. As if you and you are one. We fight for this breath. A breath to fill up our collective lung.